What's up, everybody? It's your bud, Mike O'Geeky, here tonight, Monday night, 9 p.m. Very exciting. Um, I, I, I love chit-chatting uh, with, with, with the Mike o Cool kids and uh, was really excited to sit down and talk to uh, Alan tonight. Now, I'm not going to lie. Yesterday, I saw he had a post. He was going to do a foray out, a uh, little foraging expedition today, I believe, in Humboldt County. And uh, I was like, oh, man, I hope he gets back in time for this podcast. And he has not. So um, luckily, I uh, made a few phone calls, uh, called my manager up. And uh, we have uh, we have next week's guest is going to uh, come on tonight. And uh, we're going to get into it. So I don't know if you guys uh, kind of look at the podcast playlist, um, but next week we were scheduled to talk to uh, my buddy Ed. Um, and uh, we're going to do that tonight. So uh, this guy is probably since uh, getting into uh, at-home mycology, he has been one of my absolute favorite. Uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and just call him a find. Um, he started watching the podcast, asked some really cool, compelling questions a couple times. Next thing you know, we're chit-chatting on Facebook, and uh, I am uh, uh, fell in love, man. This this guy knows a lot of stuff, and he's got a lot to teach me and, and the rest of us. So um, we're, we're, we're going to bring on uh, the, the one and only, soon to be, uh, hopefully, a notorious Ed Grand, or I, as I like to call him, Ed 1K. Here we are. <laughs> What's up, Ed? How's it last going, man? minute, last minute. Yeah. No, this is for those of you still on mute. No, this is not Alan Rockefeller. He uh, <laughs> he he did not have cosmetic surgery. He um, we yet. have to assume is out in the fields of Humboldt County. Hopefully, not kidnapped by some some can of growers uh, for trespassing <laughs> or something crazy like that. But when we get him back on, uh, I'm sure he's going to have a great story for us. So. Anyway, yeah. uh, my buddy Ed here, um, I, if I'm, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. So by the way, Ed lives in Thailand. So it is 9 a.m. He's just waking up and he did not expect to be on this podcast. So um, thank yeah. you very much for uh, showing up last minute, Ed. Um, no well, of, of course, uh, in, in the, uh, hold on. <laughs> we're we're going to make it interesting, guys. Here we go. Look who uh -oh. I got. Uh -oh. Look who uh -oh. I got from the back seat of his SUV. Um, our, hey, Alan, can you hear me? He's alive. Good. I think. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, so I had not heard from you, and I set up somebody else to go on tonight. Um, but are you ready to go? Do are, are you ready to do this? You maybe look slightly not like you're back home yet. What, what do you uh, want? Yeah, I'm in Eureka, Arcada, and okay. the internet seems kind of slow here, so you sound very choppy. Yeah. Okay, so how about this? I mean, me and Ed and everybody else, we were definitely looking forward to uh, going going on tonight with you. Do you want to just reschedule for next week, um, next Monday? Does that work? Oh, man, the internet is being slow and glitching out, so I guess it wouldn't work anyway, and uh, rescheduling is probably a good yes. idea. Okay, uh, dude. I'll be you... home on Wednesday. Perfect. Okay. Okay, then, so you and I will talk, and we will get this figured out maybe for next week then. Yeah, I mean, next week I'll be at home, and the internet there is super fast. So, uh, So, yeah, that cool, sounds man. good. All right. Well, I hope you had a great day today uh, in Eureka, and I, I can't wait to see your post for, uh, maybe tomorrow and the next day about all the stuff you found. Yeah. Yep. I got good stuff. Cool, man. All right. Well, yeah, so we will reschedule. All right. Let's do that. All right. You take care. You get some sleep. You go sequence some DNA uh, before you get some shut eye. Okay. <laughs> that sounds good. Cool, man. All, All right. right. All right. Later, Take care. Alan. Talk soon. All right, guys.
Well, at least we heard from him. At least I, I literally kind of slightly was like, I hope he's not like lost in the woods. He's so still uh, alive. he's Dude. still alive. This is great. All right. So um, where were we here? Uh, oh, you guys, before, can you guys excuse my earmuffs? My my little foamy thing <laughs> broke yesterday, so I had to put some my, some socks on my ears. Uh, oh, my God. Uh, it, it, I, can, it actually, I think I can hear better. It's, it's kind of nice. I might keep these. Hey, you know what? <laughs> They're clean. That's, They're clean. It's a ballsy move, um, but like I understand about comfort. Um, these are 20 bucks, man. I am going to send you a link to these headphones. They're they're super comfy yeah, and they I, look I way cooler than, than those, but it's okay. Yeah, this looks right. a little ghetto. Ghetto, okay. ghetto earmuffs. Ghetto it's okay. You, ghetto you're earmuffs. you're in the, the mean streets of Bangkok, Thailand. I get how it is. You you can't just walk down to Walmart and pick the shit up. I get it. Yeah. Uh, um, I okay, for those of you just tuning in, five minutes in, um, uh, Alan had been MIA. Um, he did show up uh, in the backseat of a car in Eureka, California, to inform us that his internet connection was terrible and he was running late. So we're going to reschedule him probably for next week would be my guess. Um, but my uh, next week's guest, uh, I managed uh, to wake him up from uh, Bangkok, Thailand and get him to agree to come on last minute and uh, just get into things early. So anyway, as I was saying before, um, Ed, uh, my first exposure to him was him asking some interesting, uh, pointed and seemingly intelligent questions in the uh, comments section of one of my early podcasts. Uh, we got to talking and, uh, he seemed to know a few things. And so I just started asking questions and I got to know him, um, and realized that, uh, I'd stumbled on a gold, gold mine of, uh, mycology wealth. So, um, and he's very interesting. He he walks a fine line between, um, you know, the the the, the academic uh, good, you know, good Samaritan and, you know, riding on the back of a moped down Bangkok, you know, the mean streets of Bangkok, you know, chucking shrooms at people, uh, you know, at three in the morning. So we're going to talk about all this stuff. And uh, I hope you guys, uh, despite it not being what you expected, I'm, I'm hoping you guys are going to have a good time. So the, the first thing I, I now, when I was going to plan this podcast out, I was going to actually have a, a card to pull this up. Um, but uh, in my, one of my early conversations with Ed, he sent him, he sent me a text that uh, I forget how we stumbled onto, onto this, but he said, uh, he sent me this message that said, uh, all my colleagists eventually end up in the sane asylums. Yeah, so, after uh, reading that International Code of Botanical Nomenclature, you... Uh... Yes, yes, yes. Ooh, that thing's nice. um, so, so, okay, a little... We should do this just since uh, a lot... I mean, a few people in my Discord are getting to know you and know who you are. Um, a few people on Facebook and some of your uh, YouTube followers know who you are. But uh, for the most part, a lot of these people watching probably don't have a clue who you are. So let's uh, talk a little bit about... Um, where you're from, how you got into mycology, and uh, let's just walk through like your 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 mycology journey. How about that? Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, oh yeah, I guess I was. I, I'm gonna hide my face. Am I? We just <laughs> you didn't even get your morning shaving, dude. No, didn't okay. even. It, it's okay. Well, you know, I've been doing mycology for gosh, uh, my entire life. You know, I'm 48 now, and I I started okay. out like a lot of those Michigan people with uh, morel hunting. Yeah, yeah. According to my mom, I was on the back, on her back in a, in a sort of a trap back basket when I was like six months old, you know, out there looking for morels, trying to sure. get that little side hustle. You know, my family, we didn't grow up real rich, you know, so we always had little side hustles, cutting wood mm -hmm. and selling honey. And, oh, see, now I know um, you're from Michigan. I'm also from Michigan. And you just said side hustle, cutting wood. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you didn't have a stack of firewood on your, in your front yard, you know, who were you? Yep. I don't even exactly yeah our grass uh wasn't doing so well in the springtime because we usually had about 40 cords or face cords i should say yeah 
uh, a wood stacked in the front yard with, you know, the old cardboard sign, $40 a, a face cord. And uh, yeah. yeah, that was, uh, man, my dad yeah. was like this rip beat. He was like the beast. Like, I don't know, all the ladies yeah. from around the neighborhood were like, hey, Don, <laughs> like, what you doing? <laughs> Chopping firewood? Uh, like, you'd be out there with like a five pound sledge in like, you know, February, like whacking wood apart. And all the ladies <laughs> love that. My mom didn't like it too much. but, uh, but the ladies Yeah, she probably it. didn't like it when like... Uh, when your dad asked you to hold the hose and aim it at him as he like ripped his shirt off and then smashed firewood. Oh yeah. yeah. He might've been holding some of the hose too. I don't know. Yeah. Like uh, <laughs> some stories there, but, uh, oh, but yeah, I, I started off uh, just basically, you know, as a kid, like wandering around the woods, like most Michigan people do. And uh, we, that's what I, we I actually do. got it. Yeah, it's just part of the life there. And I, I grew up like looking for wild edibles. I got into really got into Yule Gibbons and uh, those wild foraging books. Yeah, there was an old fellow named Yule Gibbons. And I, I found some books in the local library. And I just really, really got into plants. And then eventually, I just started to like wonder what all the mushrooms were. I guess I just thought yeah. they were all mushrooms like a lot of people do just like, yeah, they're mushrooms. And then I started to realize, like, oh, you can like eat some of these, <laughs> and then that yep. that just that just expanded. And then I went into a, um, I found a local club, the Michigan Mushroom Hunters. Somehow I don't remember. They may have been running an ad in the paper or something for one of their forays. I don't or what it was you know those little weekend sections or something. Mm -hmm. Went out. Wait, to so okay, we might have some some younger viewers. So when he says paper, he means oh, the yeah. a printed yeah. newspaper. Yeah, like the New York Times used to be. Imagine the New York Times website like on a piece of paper. <laughs> like the stuff Sorry. you put at the I bottom of a bird cage or something. You know? <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> but yeah, and then that just, man, uh, I went to so now How old were you when you linked up with that, that local Myco club? That would have been probably about 19. I was already in okay. Ann Arbor, so that was kind of okay, convenient cool. because a lot of their forays were, were sort of in the Waterloo area. Oh, and yeah. I grew it's up gorgeous, in Jackson. Oh, yeah, which is, oh, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, so Jackson is just a little bit west of that whole area. And then they started doing things like kind of in the suburbs of Detroit. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. Proud Lake, I think, was one of them. And Devil's Lake or something like that. They had all these funny names okay. for lakes. Um, yeah, and I, I ran into a couple guys, one fellow named Larry and uh, Marty Cochran. She was a, a woman named Marty, who's the only person uh, I've ever met who was actually allergic to Sawillis. Like if she... Oh, where'd you go, Ed? We're having all the luck here tonight, guys. Um, so just, just to re recap here again... Uh, Alan was running late and he touched base for a minute in the backseat of car in Eureka, California. Um, last minute I pulled on Ed here uh, to, to cover and he is from Bangkok, Thailand. And so uh, he informed me yesterday. I said, Hey, just plug into your ethernet. And he said, well, they don't really do it that way here. So, so we're, we're, oh. we might be dealing with some, some Wi-Fi issues occasionally. So anyway, you're yeah. back. Okay. You cut off there uh, froze for a second. So you, you in Ann Arbor, you met up with this local crew and you had just started mentioning a woman named Marty. Yeah, Marty Cochran. She was uh, she was the only person I've ever met who was allergic to Sawillis. She would just touch him and immediately get a, a reaction, hmm. like sort of, you know, dermatitis or whatever you call it. Right. Contact dermatitis. Yeah. yeah. And her husband, he was a little bit older, but he was some sort of academic. And then uh, I, I just I, I didn't even really, to be honest, know that people studied mushrooms academically. Right. Like I thought I knew people got high and I knew people like ate them. Right. <laughs> like that was pretty much it. Correct. And then a guy, uh, well, you know, that was when I was 19. Of course, you know, I got my first eight. I might, we might as well get into that straight away. Sure, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you live in Ann Arbor and you don't have your first yeah, eight story, exactly. I mean, yeah. exactly. I'd be lying. Right. right. You would, you wouldn't believe me if I said, uh, yeah, <laughs> No. But yeah, you know, one of my buddies, you know, was like, hey, you know, we got these dried mushrooms. And I, I was like, oh, let me get an eighth of those. And, you know, typical, typical kind of disappointing split an eighth between like three people. And we're That's, like, eh, yeah, that was my really teenage much. experiences. Yeah. Yeah. It was M like mild really, effects. 
Yeah, I knew something was there, you know, but not not didn't quite get there. And then uh, right. and then I think I chomped a whole eighth by myself. And then I was like, whoa, OK, there we go. That worked. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah. It's kind of like the first time you smoke weed, you know, you're like, eh, am I high? And it took me about five times. And then I was like, oh, that's what it like. That's right, what it right. feels like to be, you know, staring at the wall for an extended yes. amount of time. Like, oh, I get yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, that yeah, first time the grass turns into serpents and yeah, the, the walls no. start vibrating. And <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Not cool. they, they didn't have uh, whatever apes or whatever back then. They said, right. You know, good old Becca. Uh, back back yeah, when so I was like, young, I had to eat a whole bag of mushrooms yeah, in order to exactly. yeah. right. three and a half yeah. gram barely did it. Correct. Yes. And they were, God knows who. I think the second batch we got were still like half dehydrated. Oh, uh, yeah. And the guy was like, Oh, you better eat them, you know, today because they're going to they go bad. Yeah. And <laughs> That's it was just crazy. like, Oh, my. Maybe now that's why I'm so meticulous. I got like a $250 dryer because I'm just like, I'm never eating a half dryer uh, again. Yes, you know, correct. that's just not, not acceptable. So, so yeah. And then of so, course the entrepreneurial. So, this, so, so you were, you were roaming around Ann Arbor with a bunch of people that knew way more about mushrooms and I'm imagining yeah. botany in general than, than you had ever been exposed to. Now, did you, were you made, yeah. what were you majoring in at the, at that time? Yeah, engineering, chemical oh, engineering. engineering. Okay. So I kind of uh, at about the same time discovered the Alexander Shulgin books, uh, Tickle oh, and yep. Tickle or Pickle Tickle, whatever people call them. I thought it was Tikal, but okay. I mean, yeah, yeah, chemist, not me. No, you know, to be honest, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody uh, like say enunci- it, yeah. you know say it out out loud. Uh, Tickle, t- Tickle, mm-hmm. yeah. That, that oh, just a quick, uh, Hori Sai says greetings from Bangkok. Oh, okay. All right, we yeah, man, that's that. good. We were trying to figure out somebody was around here a couple of weeks ago, I remember. But yeah, yeah we can get, feel yeah. free to contact me later. Cool. Yeah, I'm just. Uh, All right, so outside. chemical engineer, University of Michigan, wandering around the woods. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, yeah, so cool. then. Uh, Discover that all end all ring, the tryptamine uh, kind of tennis structures. And then I honestly was really, really into organic chemistry. And if Breaking Bad would have been like on the TV back then, I I, I, I don't know. I, I, I really didn't want to get into the whole illegal synthesis route with precursors and all that sure. back then. That was the 80s, 90s. That was like serious serious prison time you know so i thought like hey man like these cultures of mushrooms look like other cultures of mushrooms and spawn looks like spawn spawn is spawn and like you know i did the whole under the desk i actually had a roommate at the time in a room that wasn't much bigger than the room i'm sitting in now and i managed to somehow make a little fruiting chamber under my like desk what would be like a computer desk Okay. And man, this, this guy, I did that for about six months and my roommate for some reason had no idea what I was doing. Wow. But, you know, I had the all American like 921 and I was doing like the 4 a.m. like pressure cooker runs and, oh my God, that's and cool. then like mixing spawn when he was at class. And I mean, he was dosed on like 10 strips half the time. So he didn't even know. He didn't care. Like, mostly yeah, anyway. what was going on. Yeah, yeah, and he, you were just like, I don't want him to know because I don't want him to start eating all my mushrooms. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly, man. He's gonna want them for free. Like, I I need to to pay for books, man. I gotta, I gotta buy books. You know, five hundred dollars worth of books. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. That was back when you couldn't get the PDF. Yeah, exactly. Not get the PDF, man. It was like the mafia of books. Yep. And all the all the teachers wanted you to buy their latest edition because they were the author. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, it always worked out that way. That if they were if they wrote a textbook, yeah, I believe you had to buy theirs. Yes, oh, I think really? I know. We I think we probably went to the same bookstore. Yeah, yeah there were pretty I, much just two, but yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, okay. I, I so didn't open, I didn't open most of them. So you you graduated chemical engineering. You were you were growing mushrooms. Somehow. Somehow yeah. I managed it. Yeah. Uh, amongst all, all, all the other fun stuff. And yeah. uh, so what did you do after chemical engineering? 
Yeah, well, this is where I loved Ann Arbor. So um, I wanted to stay there. And I was just kind of bored one day. I'd worked at the library um, doing like, you know, the student student work, just moving boxes and things like that. And I and I just went on the, the university website and found a lab research job and like walked over across campus, did an interview. And the guy's like, yeah, sure, we'll hire you. And that was for a gastroenterologist, which is like a stomach doctor. Yeah. Um, so that was fascinating because that dude had like grants that were like millions of dollars. And wow. so we could just basically like I, I would find a paper and he would be I'd like, oh, this seems like really cool. Like, you know, some weird technique with, uh, you know, I used to uh, do a lot of RNA, DNA, like all that kind of stuff. Pretty much everything. We did everything. And uh, he'd be like, yeah, order it. And I'm like, well, it costs <laughs> like six hundred dollars for like this antibody. He's like, yeah, just order it. Right. I'm like, you sure? Like, I don't really like know what the fuck I'm doing. Like, he's yeah, like, yeah, just know. order it. Yeah, whatever. Just do it. That's funny. That's <laughs> so, yeah, hilarious. we did a lot of cool stuff. I worked with a lot of, like, mainland Chinese people. So that was kind of interesting because, mm -hmm. like, going to the lunchroom was, like, going on a little vacation. Like, the food sure. and the smells and the chatter. So were and it were was you North like, Campus then or where, where where at in Ann Arbor were you? That was right there on the medical campus in one oh, of the okay. um, MSRB buildings, medical right. science research. I think okay. I forgot when it was two or three. Yeah, we had this like a pretty big bake break room and it was just like, wow, the smells, you know, I mean, a lot of people. For a young about, kid. Yeah. From Michigan. Yeah. The night. Well, I, well, I would have been like 22 or 23 then. And yeah, I wasn't really prepared for the whole like mainland Chinese experience quite yeah. yet. Yes, it is. <laughs> I, I tried it is to socialize, but it was it was like a little bit much. You know, there were some cute girls in there, too. I was like, mm, you know, but they 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 were. Yeah, kind of un right. unavailable. So, um, so you did a bunch of stuff. You said DNA, RNA. So, what were you doing uh, exactly with with these guys? And how long were you with these guys? Yeah, that was three, a uh, little, almost two and a half, three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were doing. I did a lot of what are called northern blots, which are basically where you. Ex it's kind of like a DNA extraction, but you do a couple more steps. Okay. Uh, but it's nucleic acid. So you essentially extract RNA from from cell extracts, which we had we had what we were called tumor cell lines or immortalized cells. We worked okay. a lot with HEK 293 cells, uh, which are human embryonic kidney and then right. some immortalized cell line. Uh, we also did primary cells, which are, um, you know, derived from animals uh and then we would extract rna and dna and uh and, and mostly i did a lot of a lot of dna stu uh, rna stuff i should say rna is quite sensitive and for fun uh, for some reason i was pretty good at extracting um extracting stuff rna is a little more sensitive to you know these kind of the contaminants you might have laying around like like on okay. your thing, like uh, enzymes that degrade the rna because, you know, RNA is like single stranded and blah, 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 blah. It's, it, it's it, not it, as stable, right, as DNA yeah, as far exactly. as its structure. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So you got to be really, really. So that's where my kind of like laboratory OCD skills like kicked okay. into high gear about like labeling stuff and being just meticulous. We also worked with a lot of radionucleotides like phosphorus 32 and tritium and carbon. I think it was carbon and what were you doing with that stuff? Were you doing stuff with humans or just? No, that was all that was all extract. OK, so so when we were doing we were basically labeling um, for the RNA, you label a probe that's essentially complementary to what you're looking for. Oh, and then it, so it's, but it's, it's a bit like the DNA sequence where you basically do an extract and then you do the electrophoretic gel and then you, you mm -hmm. separate the RNA fragments based on their size, okay. uh, essentially size. And then you probe them. So that's where you'll take like a P32, uh, uh, something that has uh, one of the nucleotides that's been labeled usually by the company uh, with a with a P32. So like, a you know, like ATP, as an example, adenosine triphosphate, it's got three right. phosphoruses in them. So they'll usually take the term terminal phosphorus in that and they'll you can switch it 
with uh, uh, with the radioactive phosphorus. And then you take that and you probe it with whatever you're looking for. And then you take right. that little nitrocellulose piece of, it looks like a piece of paper, like almost like a post-it note. Uh, and that's got sort of the stuck on right. probe. And then you put that onto, a, onto an x-ray. Uh, just normal film, like you just take a big old sheet of like, you know, camera film and you just expose it for you know maybe an hour maybe four hours maybe overnight and then you put that through the x-ray developer and then you've got these little black lines on this hopefully clear sheet of x-ray film and then right. you quantify them and do all that stuff so yeah so, you yeah, had was, so even i mean you would have had experience in the lab with the degree but then immediately afterwards you were lots of lab work yeah, strangely enough, you know, Michigan, I mean, my classes had 300 people in them mostly. So we didn't really get to do a lot of lab stuff. Oh, really? Um, yeah, it was a little bit remarkable considering the amount of money you pay to go to a lot of major universities. And you were not stations. doing as much lab work no, as you No, know. not at all. You know, the best, I, I took a microbiology lab. So so kind of coinciding mm -hmm. with my whole interest in the whole, uh, you know, kind of psychedelic aspects of mushrooms. I was taking a microbiology class because I was like, you know, I need to learn how to do sterile tissue culture. <laughs> like yeah. if I'm going to do You're this like, I got mushrooms to sell guys let's actually yeah. get a degree that exactly. means something here these things aren't going to grow themselves you know so um so I I I wish I could remember this guy but I I he caught me stealing um petri dishes one day after a lab you know, I don't know, uh -huh. steal and borrow them they might have fell in my backpack I don't know you know sure. but right. he's he just borrowed them do it. yeah I was just borrowing them for some you know mm -hmm. homework and and there was a stack of about 20 and I probably got about five of them in my pocket. And uh, he's like, you know, what are you doing? He was trying to be all like, you know, Mr. Good Cop, Bad Cop about it. And he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, uh, uh, uh. And he's like, yeah, just take all of them. He's like, I know. Wow. This is Ann Arbor professor, you know, he's like. Oh, so he was like, down. He was yeah, he. <laughs> whatever yeah, yeah. oh he like, went to hash bash you yeah. better believe it yeah. oh yeah, yeah 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 he was probably the dude with the microphone on the on the grad school steps at hash yeah. back like throwing out joints <laughs> yes. but yeah um, that was uh man they were some crappy e coli plates or whatever they were but man mm -hmm. the 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 spores i got a spore syringe from the back of high times magazine and yeah. Yeah, that started it, man. I had my All American. Uh, yeah, that was so. You were how like, old? You were at? You were undergrad. Gosh, I don't know, you man. Know. The, you know, the timeline is a bit. T uh, I would have been like twenty three then. Okay. So when I started to cut, what actually do the cultivation? I, I that must though. Well, that was my last year. So I, I took a I took a micro class because I needed one more elective and I was like, yeah. oh, that'll work. Um, so I would have been like 22. So I don't think I technically was I hadn't started working in the lab yet. That would have been my last year. And and to be honest, that's a bit I got a, I got in a little trouble. My roommate in another room in the same house. I lived in this co-op with like 40 people. Yeah, I moved rooms with another guy and his brother in law was a freaking cop. <laughs> So that would be that was becoming a little tenuous. And his brother, the police man, wanted something, and I was gonna give him a little, and he robbed me. What? <laughs> like I was at class one day and I came back and I looked in my little I had a mini fridge, you know, like all those college beer fridges. Right. And like I had a half pound in there and they were gone. <laughs> And um, yeah. I was like, hey, Kevin, like, what's up with this? Like, I thought he wanted an eight, not eight ounces. Right. And yeah, that was like, it freaked me out enough. He was, I hate to say it, he was that cop you see in the movies, you know, like yeah. training day, like, yep. like bad, bad, bad news, you know, beating up Snoop Dogg and stuff like that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Like he was, he was a bad guy, man. And so I ended up getting him back and he had mashed them into a powder and took out about four ounces. And I'm like, really, dude, like, is this the way, this way the guys were all. So yeah, I took a few years off and just like, um, I was, yeah, that, that'll, that, that'll scare you a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, back then, it. even Ann Arbor, I didn't want to, yeah. I didn't really want to become associated with the, uh, you know, the refuse of Ann Arbor and Ipsy man, Ipsy down the road. Ipsy was a little bit, Ipsilani was a little Ipsy bit rougher. Tucky. 
Yeah, yeah, that was. Uh, I mean, yeah. now, dude, I lived in Ipsy for a couple years while I was going to school in Ann Arbor, just because it was cheaper rent. Um, yeah, and there's some mm -hmm. good times to, you know, house parties are cooler. The house parties mm -hmm. in Ann Arbor yeah. are like you know, like a bunch of boring intellectuals, you know, like trying to, you know, mentally jack each other off all night talking yeah. about some 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 theoretical this that and the other thing. And I'm like, man, I came to get drunk and wasted and play yeah. music. And so we, you know, we we do house parties. I was in a band, and so we do house parties in Ipsy all the time. And I had way more fun in Ipsy, but. Yeah, a little, definitely a different scene as far as uh, things to be concerned about. Yeah, mm, for sure. All right, so so you do that for a while. What do you do? How do you get from that to going to um, Tennessee? Serendipity, man. Just like right now, I I was at my my lab job, and one day, you know, uh, you guys, a lot of you guys probably don't remember Netscape, but I did yeah. a Netscape search. Like Netscape was the Google uh, Google of the time, and I was like waiting for my you know gel electrophoresis to run or something to hybridize or whatever. <coughs> and um, and yeah, I did it. I did a sorry. Yeah, you guys. I, uh oh. Are you recovering from COVID as well? <laughs> yes, I, I am actually. Oh, I, you're I, literally are. Okay. I, I did a test yesterday and it was negative, but I think oh, I'm still, still not it lingers. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I just did a Netscape search and I, I don't know, I typed in something innocuous like mushroom research or something and immediately i think it was bc came up wash something in washington uh toronto and tennessee and i just like sent emails off to people this is this is something i encourage people to do now a lot when you, when you're interested in something just send emails like yeah. old white dudes like emails still so like if right. you want to contact somebody just send them an email um, you know, I don't know, LinkedIn or whatever, blah, 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 whatever people right. do now. But man, to like, like email, yeah. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it gives you a time to like process it. And it shows that you have the motivation to actually, you know, type something more than a text <laughs> or send right. an emoji. And it shows, uh, man, I encourage a lot of younger people. Um, you know, I teach now and I, the, these 20, to, you know, 22, 23 year old kids. I'm just like, you know, if you're interested, if you want to know about a topic, just email the author. The yeah, worst thing they know. can do is ignore mm -hmm. you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, dude, like, I did that. I, I read this book called uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, written by a guy named Jared oh, Diamond. He yeah. won the Pulitzer Prize yeah. for it. And I forget at the time, it was a little dense, a little academic. But I, I yeah. forget what question I had, but I'm like, I know this guy's a professor here in, in Los Angeles. I'm going to just email him the question. Fucking had a five email exchange back and forth with him. It was, I'm like, yeah, just email people. You if if you think somebody knows something you want to know, exactly. yeah, worst they're gonna do is not respond to you. Yeah, you would be surprised at, and yeah. you know, there's maybe you'll catch them sitting bored in their office one afternoon, and you'll have a good old chat with them. And and for me, that yeah. ended up with um, basically a free PhD. Like I, oh, I, so you you reached out to somebody at the university yeah. and was just yeah, shooting correct. the shit with them. And the next thing you know, they're saying you want a PhD. Exactly. Like wow. a week, the next weekend, uh, Ron Peterson. Oh, 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 yeah. oh, you guys can figure it out. It's cool. Yeah, I mean, Ron most, mo I didn't know who he was until you told me about him either. Yeah. So. Most, uh, he's, he's a, he was a very prolific guy. Um, when I, he, the first person I met and told them my, uh, advisor was Ron. They were like, Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. Like they were like, so like, like he's, he, he's, he was very proud of his kind of uh, reputation as being an asshole. I'm sure. He, 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 he kind of fed off it and people were genuinely like scared of him when we were at conferences and they'd see him walk in the room. They'd like, fuck, you could see him like tense up, like, ah, like, oh shit, Ron's here. Like, oh man, I thought he wasn't coming, you know? Um, but yeah, he was. A now they got to be on their best behavior. Yeah. He, right. he knew his stuff, but it was very, very esoteric kind of like you know weird like uh things that were published by freeze in like you know 1892 in a, some right. some scandinavian journal of like blah 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 he was he, he took was being an academic very seriously yeah yeah, yeah. he was he was also a really cool guy he kind of became like my second dad 
Um, cool. Yeah, I got kind of, I don't know. He was, he was just, he was a jerk. You know, I, I wanted to punch him in the face many, many times, uh, but he probably wanted to punch me in the face too. Sure. So, you know, when you're in a car driving for like eight hours with somebody, you have a very tenuous academic work relationship right. with, it gets a little bit tense sometimes, you know? <laughs> Yeah, but that's what you do. You know, you, you grow up and you realize that, like, yeah, people get over this kind of stuff pretty quick. So, you be- so you're emailing back and forth with, with somebody there mm. at the, the University of Tennessee and they say, come get a Ph.D. for free. How long between that email exchange and when you're like driving down to Tennessee? Like I literally was there like four days later and, and I saw Knoxville and I was like, I want to come here. There, it was very, very much a college town, at least near the, the area they call the Strip, which is on the on Cumberland Avenue, which is, is kind of like Main Street of like mm-hmm. downtown Knoxville. And uh, man, I, I found the, the place where all the bars were. And I saw, uh, you know, I saw some of the undergraduate <laughs> girls and I saw the sports facilities, uh, which I used to be in really into lifting weights and stuff, you know. Right. And uh, man, I was like, I think I could dig on some of these southern girls you know like nice. <laughs> not I'm, I'm making it sound like i'm some man whore or something but you know right. well you're, you're a young I'm, man so that's yeah you, have to you know say the I was, word I was, yes. exactly as as right. you know, a young boy i think i was uh gosh i was 26 then and yeah those you know the all those redheads and and uh yeah Sure. <laughs> you know and i was like yeah. wow and i get to study mushrooms like i get to move south it's warmer right michigan was man michigan was getting to be a bit of a pain with the weather oh, like yeah. i get to move south there's pretty girls and i like to and i get to study mushrooms and i love right. pork rinds you know and, and everything about pork. so it was really the pork rinds <laughs> that's what sealed the deal okay pork rinds and I beer can... man chicken right. and beer you know pork rinds yeah. chicken and beer that was and a and Knoxville's right on the river. It's right up against the Smokies there. And uh, but yeah, that was uh, I had to do like we we're talking about the uh, lab, like what what they call them, lab, but teaching assistants or something yeah, like that. Yeah, TAs. And so I did like yeah, TA, TA. I did a couple of those a week, like a botany lab, and uh, just you know set up. I think I, I you know kind of helped the kids like learn the microscopes and stuff like right. that. You know, went out ripped off some flowers from the bushes and ripped them apart in lab. Right. So yeah, that was that this was pretty is much the it. stamen. Yeah, exactly. This is your ovary. This is <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um but, but yeah that was that was quite nice. Tennessee. I love I love Tennessee. Uh I, I don't know. That's probably right there in the middle. Uh it was is a little bit red at times, you know, but like you know it's all good. Sure. I, I know that feeling. Yes, I'm here in Ohio. So, yeah, so you yeah. go. You're, so you're a chemist, right? You're a chemical engineer from U of M. You all of a sudden are now a PhD candidate in a in a botany mycology program. Um, how do you make that transition? And then, like, what does that look like in the beginning? that then ultimately leads to you having this very precise, you know, thesis topic that you're doing your dissertation. Like, I don't even know. I didn't know much about when you mentioned it, that you could skip the masters and go straight to just a PhD program. Like what does the the Uh, actual curriculum look like at first? Yeah, that's a very good question because a lot of people don't realize that most of the, um, if you're going, if you have any aspiration to get a PhD, they will encourage you to just skip the master's. Uh, just go straight. Um, to okay. Yeah, because once you get those letters, the other letters don't matter anymore. Um, right. Like, and they also want that maybe if they, if they want that commitment from you. Right. Because. Um, at least in in my department, the master's people were the the people who were like, well, I just want to make another, you know, five thousand dollars a year. Right. Yeah, they they weren't right. really into it, and a lot of the people they were almost like glorified uh, like undergraduate projects. You know, sure. oh yeah, do do a few DNA sequences, write up a few pages, and then you know, well, like Thank a big God, book master. report. Big yeah, book report. yeah, and, and, yes. yeah, and the master's thesis, did. the big book report. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not it's to true. degrade anyone who's got a master's, but but at least in the sciences, you you if you're gonna do anything that's geared towards a publication, you need to like really really get into it. Uh, so the yeah, first, it's pretty rigorous. 
Yeah, the first yeah. two years is almost just like a preempt to the real deal. So I ended up taking a lot of classes because one of my advisors was that uh, she taught genetics and she was really, really super into the kind of under, you know, the underlying stuff. She she ironically wasn't really that much into mushrooms, but she had published a lot because she knew more of the, the genetic side of it, mostly just sequencing. Back then, sequencing right. was quite expensive and it was really... Wow really sort of like cutting edge stuff you know yeah it was a big Getting deal like, like if you were mm. if that if you were a scientific academic that's what you probably wanted to be doing yeah, yeah. that was okay. that was like going to the moon back then you know that was like right. wow you published a paper that had like 20 new sequences back when they actually literally would publish the dna sequence <laughs> was, all yeah. the acgs and three pages G's, of like AC, in the yes. paper yeah and it was like wow thank goodness for gen bank yeah um so i think i ended up with my my final dissertation i had like 250 sequences wow you know it was like so that was like pushing my my analyses would take like literally 24 hours on the computer right like things i can do on my pc or probably even my phone that takes like three minutes would take like 24 hours on a server that was like running through a telnet prompt on some like giant right. you know Right. whatever cut unix machine somewhere in a room yep. yeah and uh, school, yeah, man. yeah it was crazy and if you put in some command or some parameter wrong <laughs> you'd, you'd yeah. go on the next day and it would say like error <laughs> or you'd get some weird tree that didn't make any sense and you'd be like oh my god i forgot to freaking move that one or your alignment i forgot people a don't comma. know yeah, exactly, right. man. Yeah, you know, you probably mm -hmm. did some Fortran or basic or whatever yeah. people do now, Python, you know, you got a, yeah, apostrophe in the wrong place and the yep. whole thing just goes haywire. Um, but yeah, that was, that was fun. But to be honest, I didn't really know, like a lot of people that start PhDs, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. Mm -hmm. So I were you, so at that point, cause you're, I, here's what I'm wrapping my head around. So your background is chemistry. I'm assuming then that means you take a lot of chemistry classes. And I imagine, yeah. I mean, I had to take four years of a language at U of M for no fucking reason other than they decided I had to. So, I mean, I'm assuming you had some basic other science courses, but to shift from chemistry to botany uh, and specifically mycology, like, were you taking just basic botany classes? Were you taking, you know, a series of DNA yeah. genetics? Like, I'm assuming you have to kind of catch up, right? I did. Yeah, that was the first okay. like year and a half or so of my of my PhD was me just sitting in on undergraduate classes. <laughs> genetics, okay, that's what literally. I wondered. Yeah, because I uh, I didn't really have a good grasp on. I mean, I hate to even admit it, but I kind of probably didn't even really know what DNA was. <laughs> like, yeah. like I, I kind of knew that, it, you know, the whole central dogma and the, the, the DNA, RNA, protein thing. I kind of had a sure. vague idea of that. And because I was into like bodybuilding, I knew about proteins and carbohydrates and things like sure. that. But other than that, I, I had a pretty remedial knowledge of like what the hell the ITS region is and what's an intron and an exon Right. And we, you know, what the hell is sense, anti-sense, coding, non-coding? Like I had no clue. <laughs> yeah. like, so like me right now. Yes. Yes. Mm. I don't know. I also have a very rudimentary understanding of genetics. I mean, I think I can't remember what the name of the class was, but there, there was a fair amount of genetics work in it, but it was not you know, it's basic at this point, you could watch a few Khan Academy videos and probably catch up to, to the same level that, that, that class went into it. So that is specifically, yeah. we, we won't, we won't go down that rabbit hole just yet, but that is uh, for those watching uh, just a, a quick recap. Uh, Alan's out. He uh, got stuck uh, and was run a little bit late and, didn't have good reception uh, in Eureka, California, so we'll be rescheduling him. And luckily, um, my guest for next week, uh, I woke him up. Uh, he's from Bangkok, Thailand, and he agreed to come on uh, last minute. So we're, we're doing next week's podcast tonight. So uh, we're talking with Ed Grand. He is a PhD level mycologist uh, turned uh, university professor in Thailand. He, he's done a few things and we're getting to know him. So right now we're, 
we're we're up to him getting his PhD, and uh, we're we're going to keep going from here. So, all right. So, you're how do you go from those beginner classes to um, like? Does Ron sit you down and go, you know, what the fuck do you want to do, man? Or do you kind of have to bring stuff to him? You, you, you know, like, how do you get from, because I can say right now, uh, I think I mentioned this to you before, my sister got an undergrad at U of M as well uh, in the nuclear engineering program. And she had a professor who's similar to your uh, gastroenterologist guy. He had more funded research than he had time to, to do it. And he just handed her projects and she went and got her master's in, in a year and a half and it was done. Um, but I'm imagining for you shifting from chemistry to botany, th there was a process. And I'm curious how you got and ultimately settled on, you know, very advanced taxonomical considerations for, for fungi. Yeah, that's that's another interesting one too because i walked into ron's lab and he had i think five hundred thousand dollars like basically laying around and he had three other students at the time and he i hate to say it i was his last student and he kind of okay. just didn't give a fuck anymore <laughs> oh like he was about to retire you yes. were his last academic yeah. obligation basically. okay and he had like I think he had an NSF grant, which was 500,000 that had, was totally untapped. I mean, mm -hmm. this guy wrote like 250 academic papers and like eight monographs, which are big books on a particular right. genus. He was into the coral fungi, like Romaria, Claveria and all that. Okay. And this dude, like he had written Lenton Ellis and a couple of their books too. And, okay. uh, he just like he was one of those people like they just gave him money even if he didn't want it kind of thing. yeah <laughs> like, I mean, he was a trustworthy like, researcher like yeah. they just trusted eventually he'd put it to good use yeah like, exactly like, another that. book yeah they know he's going to publish another book on some other obscure thing that nobody right. else really cares about but <laughs> like what are you doing right. um yeah. so yeah he just basically told me to figure out what i wanted to do and i was like of course, the first thing that popped in my mind, I want to study psilocybes, of course. Right. But how, oh, know, I'm curious. Uh, yeah. Like, did how, how did he, how was that received? By well, you know, my lab mate studied Melanotis, which is this little pleuritoid. They're mostly only about the size of a quarter, which is actually, well, it used to be in this Drophary ACE, which is, which is what psilocybes in or mm -hmm. psilocybe, whatever. Um, and I was like, man, you know, could I swing that? Like, is another dark sport, agaric? Right. Like, can I swing psilocybe, maybe Coplandia or Paniolis? Right. Uh, and it's like, could I swing that? But I was like, well, you know, that was still, I mean, keep in mind, this was, you know, this was like almost 20, well, this was more than 20 years yeah, ago. Yeah, more so. than 20 years ago. Yeah, when you go to conferences, it's bad enough when you tell your friends like you study mushrooms and they're like, hey, you study mushrooms, dude. Right, you got right. those special kind? You know, it's like, yes. Jesus, again, really? It's like, yes, yeah. I do. Do you want some? Like, you don't Yeah, motherfucker, I'm going to other dimensions yeah, on every other right weekend. There, you, here. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. How many right. do you want? Yes. But, but, you know, doing doing that in the in the kind of you know the square world or whatever is uh i was like man i don't know if i want to be that dude paul stamets was still in the closet you know about <laughs> okay. and uh like everybody was like oh oh like you know you're a druggie if you study those right. so i studied lentinus I, I i you know i was gonna do auricularia which is another uh the wood ears you know, the, the wood ear, yeah. ears, whatever they call them. Yeah, the wood and, ears, uh, which are now really just great ASMR for, for Instagram yeah, feeds where yeah, yeah. it's just some <laughs> pretty girl tickling a wood ear. And yeah, it gets like yeah. 400 million views. Yeah, I know. Oh, uh, they got a little baby now here that like eats vegetables and stuff. It, it's like just eats like bok choy. Like, mm -hmm. And it's just this baby making noises. quite. But yeah, so I went through, man, I went through Melanotis, Auricularia. I was thinking about Pleurotis because Ron was doing a lot of stuff. What we're doing with the cubes now, Ron was doing with Pleurotis, oyster mushrooms, yeah. like 30 years ago. There, I, I checked, there's still a site up on the, on the Tennessee server that um, there, you know, black, back when Citrino citrinopileatus the yellow one the golden oyster that was mm -hmm. kind of like an exotic thing 
and now it's like an invasive species but that was not very well known so you know he was doing the hunger hungarian hungarian whatever hungarian, hungarian oysters and the blue oysters and all these he was doing what right. we would like to do with cubes which is basically fingerprinting them right um and and we were he was also using him and his uh uh, I, maybe I, she wouldn't like it if I said her name, but his his colleague, his mm -hmm. uh, what did what do you call her partner? It's partner, okay. um, his domestic partner, whatever he called her. <laughs> I was like, what the hell is a partner? Academics always have some weird. Uh, yeah, it's it's always it like weird. a little tricky. Yes. Yeah, I was like, are, is she like? Uh, like a trans or something like i'm so confused i'm oh, like okay. you mean your girlfriend <laughs> right <laughs> but yeah that um that was also all new terminology then but yeah so i eventually settled on lentinus which is the genus that used to contain shiitakes right. shiitakes okay. so shiitakes are in lentinula now which uh we can go into dimidic and, and monomidic hyphal systems later on if you want but Basically, that'll be for the is, hardcore people that make it past yeah, 10.30. Yes. We, we can get to like G Gymnopus and Dendrocalibia later. Um, but yeah, one of my my, my uh, lab mates, he studied what would be the little the little little brown mushrooms with white spores, which used to be all mm -hmm. in Bolivia. Um, so he was doing that. My uh, the German guy who um, sometimes forgot to shower. Shout out to Dirk. <laughs> He might be out there somewhere. He's doing all kinds of fractal AI stuff now. Who knows? Okay. He's probably trip, tripping balls somewhere in Germany. I'm sure. Um, making fractals or whatever he does now. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Dirk, man. But yeah, he was an interesting guy. That's um, funny you say that because I had – so I, I studied uh, literature, poetry, short fiction at U of M for a minute. And uh, one of my college professors who I became friends with, she ended up getting a MacArthur Fellowship. And her son was like this genius piano player. He would come over. We had a, we had a recording studio. He would like record these original compositions at like age nine that – I mean, we're legitimately impressive. And he went on to study with Wynton Marcellus and he was like a, basically a real child prodigy on the piano for jazz. And now he's just like, he goes to raves. He lives in, um, in Chelsea, Michigan in like a little yeah. condo. And he's got his little, like, you know, Subaru, he goes to his raves and he, he does exactly that. He programs like little fractal, uh, things that he posts on us I, i'm like oh my god you're just describing this this friend yeah. of mine here to a t people get into yeah. it i tried i've tried not to go down that rabbit hole but it's like yeah you know he's, he's... but yeah he st he studied calvatia and uh um puff balls mm -hmm. like okay. a herd on like the little tiny puff ball like calvatia is a big giant ones you know yeah. football size soccer ball size and uh, then he got into these little like uh, like bird net the nigularia and then the bird nest fun like cyathus and uh, nigularia okay. and these little tiny things. Um, but yeah, with with mycology in the academic world, you really got to find a niche. And I was actually maybe kind of lucky that I picked Lentinus because here, at least in Thailand, there's about four species that they sell in the market um, that are I don't it's know. Hard it's commercially yeah. significant to some degree right yeah definitely yeah. definitely so that was when i didn't even realize it but i hybridized the mushroom back then mm -hmm. because i was trying to um as i'm sure we'll get into later i was i was trying to prove the biological species concept and make a fertile right. offspring from what had been published as a new species from argentina and i had a lot of stuff from louisiana and i was I had both of the dried mushrooms and I'm looking at them like these are the same thing, you know, these are these, right. these aren't different. And luckily the guy who had collected the one from Argentina managed to get some monocarions and okay. we ended up getting a hold of those. That that's one thing with academia it gives you access to a lot of material that um, like say type specimens, which is something we might get mm -hmm. into when you have a species that's named, you have to have what's called a type specimen, which is essentially a little box of a dried mushroom that is called the type specimen. Um, and that is like the definitive guide to what that species is. Right. And like, so 
so just just to for clarity because you and i have talked about this a little bit yeah. you schooled me but just so everybody else understands and we were actually going to talk to alan about this and, and and we will a little bit later as well um whenever we we get him back on hopefully next week but basically the idea is if me or you or whoever went out and roamed around the woods and we found a mushroom and lo and behold it's a new species of mushroom and we uh you know we gen bank it, we run the DNA and we, uh, we examine the literature and we're pretty sure we have an original new distinct species. We would, we would have to have that original example of it. We would take pictures of it. We would measure, you know, anatomical structures in the gills. We would measure spore size. We would very accurately and using standard methodologies and terminology, we would describe stipe and cap and gills and, and, and try to come up with an accurate assessment that someone else could use to, if they found it somewhere else to go, well, I'm reading this, this, you know, novel species paper, and I'm looking at the photos, and I could even go on GenBank, and I could cross-reference, you know, my genome submission against that. The whole point of what you're talking about is to make sure that it is a new species and that an example of it exists somewhere, even yes, if it's exactly. a dried out piece of brittle shit as uh, yeah. you, you got to tell me about, um, you got to tell the story about that herbarium and what, what their type specimen boxes were comprised. Oh yeah. Of, I was right? just thinking about that. Yeah. A lot of old cigarette boxes. That's so what, when you, when you go to, um, back when they used to like sell cigarettes, if they still do in America, I don't know. <laughs> um, old they cigarette do. boxes. They do. They do what are they like seventeen dollars a pack? Somebody told me in England they're like twenty pounds a pack or something now. Like for, it's like something ridiculous. Wow. Like a pint, a pint's like nine pounds and like which is like twelve bucks or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. You'd go into these like ba your basic sort of um you know kind of storage cabinets, wardrobes, and there would just mm -hmm. be hundreds. Gosh, the University of Michigan herbarium. Which again, I walked in. I wish I could remember the Schaefer, Rob Schaefer. Uh, I think okay. his name was Rob Schaefer. I walked in, I, you know, I was looking in the wood chips outside and I was actually hoping to find some azuricins maybe or cyanescins. Sure. Right. And I was wandering around one of those buildings. I can't remember. It was kind of on that little curve that went to North Campus. And I was like, what is this? What's an herbarium? And I walked in and the guy just happened to be there. And I was like, hey, do you guys got like mushrooms in here? <laughs> And he was like, yeah, we got like piles of them. We back got a couple. There. Yeah. And I walked back there and it's just row after row after row of metal cabinets with a bunch of cigarette packages. in them. Wow. And these were collections from Alexander Smith, who is probably if, if historically probably in the top 10. Like when okay. you start talking about people like David Pegler and Corner and Alexander Smith, like if you pull up anything about Michigan mushrooms, um, Lactarius or even even I think he did a monograph on Melanotis and some of the dark sports stuff like Alexander Smith. He, Significant. He, he, yeah, he's very A. A. H. Smith. You'll see his name like abbreviated, which is which kind of goes back to what you were just talking about. When you publish, especially now a new species, you not only do a description, but you also will get the authority, what it's called, which is the person's name. So not only do you have that specimen and their description, you also know because oftentimes multiple people will publish, unfortunately, under the same species name. Right. So if you, if you, this is where things get really super messy because you'll have different people in different countries, maybe uh, separated by a year or two, and they might find a new species and and they'll name it the same thing. And so it gets really, really messy. Yeah, so fun. there's this little bit. So if you look at like, I hate to bring up Natalensis already, but if you see like P. Natalensis at the end, it'll say Dada Guzman. That's because right. Guzman is the guy, the mycologist who actually published the species description. There, there was actually, I think, three authors, but typically it's the one who's got the kind of biggest name or who funded right. the trip. So, yeah, like 
do you want me describing your mushroom or do you want you describing the mushroom? Do you want me describing it or do you want Ron Carlson describing it? Like you yeah. want the, the guy with the most clout and cachet. Yeah. Sure. Exactly. I mean, that makes sense. That's it's exactly. politics, but it also makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But so inevitably you end up getting a, hopefully a unique sort of a name and authority. And maybe even these days you'll see a publication God, maybe mm -hmm. even like a DOI number. Um, so you'll see that either in the footnotes or under the under the abstract to it. And that's just required um, because right. it's become so messy. I mean, I think Alan managed to track down the original publication for the Natalensis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure he'll, maybe he'll share that if he's, I, I don't know, he sent me some, somebody else seemed to like take some rather poor quality pictures of like some journal in the dark. Oh. Um, but, but I saw those. So he has tracked down the original publication and that's oh, kind cool. of the definitive source that can be really, really tricky. Even if you have access to academic people and resources and libraries, mm -hmm. it's not easy sometimes. Right. So I don't know where you want to go with that. I guess that's a big, big, deep rabbit hole. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, so I think we can touch on it a little bit because uh, uh, assuming people remain interested in, in DNA, uh, it seems like people are very interested in breeding. Um, Alan's going to talk a lot about the basics of getting into DNA sequencing, submitting to GenBank, you know, I identifying species. Um, he and I talked one day and he said, you know, so you can grow mushrooms at home, but if you're looking to evolve and get more into uh, mycology. And if you really want to take on ownership of that term mycologist, then you need to start gaining skills that allow you to identify wild found mushrooms with yeah. some level of authority. Like you need to learn how to measure, you know, and get average spore size. And you, you do need to do oil objective, you know, analysis. And so he's into that methodology. And I think that allows him to say things you know, without a PhD, he's allowed to say things like, I'm a citizen scientist, because he's trying to follow, you know, the fundamental tenets of, uh, of science as it pertains to uh, mushroom identification. So yeah, I, I think it would be good to talk a little bit about, um, yeah, I, we can either use an adolensis or just speak generally about, you um, that whole process a little bit more so yeah, people that, understand that and then yeah. and i think get into species a little bit like that biological biological species concept i think that's good basics to go that that was important for I, me I, to hear you talk I, about i i think you're right and and this is this is one of the things at the beginning is that home mycology being a citizen scientist is nothing different than academics do in a lab in a university is exactly the same thing right you got to sit down and spend hours looking through a microscope right. <laughs> that's just the way it is um you know I, you know it's kind of funny I, I i mean not to disparage anybody looking for for clamp connections out there or, or you know clampless mycelium but when you get into measuring, let's say, 40 spores in a go, right. this right. takes hours and hours and hours. Right. So you've got an elliptical spore that might shift or you're oh, like, oh, I'm looking at the wrong. Oh, it's like tilted a little bit like, I don't know, ab axially or whatever in the view. Right. And you measure eight micro or microns, you know, a um, thousand. Uh, a thousand ten thousand of a meter microns yeah, i don't know yeah. the, the little mu thing <laughs> yeah and uh i think it's a thousandth of a meter and no it's ten thousandth of a meter yeah ten yeah. Of a millimeter um so yeah you know the spores floating around in there in the liquid doo, 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 and you're trying yeah. to measure them and move the stage and they're like floating and right. it looks like those little balls you know and some kind of jello right. and you're like oh my god this is you you get a headache and you have to take that's one thing if you guys do start on microscopy remember to give your eyes a rest every 10 minutes or so right because it'll get to the point where you, you'll get so tired that you won't want to do it anymore but you know i don't know just take a rest get a coffee smoke a right. whatever people do mm -hmm. and like just chill out for a bit because you will get massive headaches when you're doing it for hours on end yeah um and, and then it, it's it's a lot of that it's a lot of the same things that i mean a typical cube grower would grow you know your your subculture and stuff you're keeping yeah. track of plates you're you're you know you're 
processing spore prints and swabs and whatever. And, and then where the other layer comes on in academia is the publication, right. which is part of the reason I got out of it because I'm really not into like the super hardcore, like publication thing and a publish or perish kind of, kind of mentality in the U S universities. And even here in Thailand, it's a, it, you need to publish to get, recognition and to get more money and to, to get, get tenure yeah, yeah. You better win some awards you better get some grants yeah. you better be publishing you better be exactly. academically relevant yeah and it, i have friends in the literary world that yeah they've yeah. published 23 novels and it's still like hey uh how's that new novel going like 23 it's novels isn't enough for them man and it's yeah. a constant thing like you never stop thinking about it yeah i mean you know i, I got my grow room and i'm thinking about that like wow i should have vented my tents earlier but eh, it'll be okay in two hours three hours whatever yeah. right they're not going to be crying too much yeah. but like when you're in academia and you're like oh shit like i've got a deadline at three o'clock this afternoon for yeah. this grant publication or sub submission and it's really not my gig man it's not, yeah. not my thing some people so thrive on but other people don't. So once you them. once you got the PhD, what did you do? And, and so now question, so you're, you know, you're officially a PhD candidate you're in Tennessee. Are you growing mushrooms at that time? Are you growing cubensis? No, well, you know, I wanted to, and to be honest, I, 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 I had a couple of friends that were like-minded. The problem is um, they were a little bit, like they smoked a bit, too much weed mm -hmm. <laughs> and so i couldn't I, I i don't know the one dude was really sketchy he was more of like the ipsy drug dealer kind of guy <laughs> like he, not really academic he was like not really a student and he was just kind of slanging you know to like pay oh, rent and right and like he he kind of put me on edge a bit like he was one of those dudes where you'd like be drinking with him and he'd just be like staring at you like oh. like it was some sort of weird movie scene like the end of blow you yeah. know where like johnny <laughs> depp's sitting there and like dude yeah. What, 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 like, it's like, I'm Johnny Depp. It's like, dude, trust me, man. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, dude. Like, I don't know. Like, just yeah. chill out, man. Yeah. But uh, I, I thought about it, but also at the time, you know, again, it was technically still. It's a different cool. scene. Yeah. It wasn't, um, it wasn't as cool. Scene, yeah. yeah. No, okay. And, so, uh, so not during then. So you get your PhD. Um, what do you do after you have now, you know, the ever allure, alluring and very, you know, promising PhD in mycology, which is getting harder and harder to come by, even the ability to get that PhD these days. W what did you do? Where did you go? Uh, you know, there's another interesting thing I had during, during my graduate school there in Tennessee, I was from Michigan. So like, I was kind of like a foreigner. So mm -hmm. I ended up hanging out with a lot of Thai people. Um, and I, you know, I got that the first like Thai girlfriend and I was just like, sure. Oh, like, this is kind of nice. Like I like, mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, Sure. And I never really, she ended up ripping my heart out and I hated all Thai people after that. And I hated Thai <laughs> women in particular. So it's kind of funny. That's not anything to do with why I ended up here. I ended up here because I went to a conference in Norway and I met this guy, uh, which um, I don't want to say his name, but sure. he um, he had a little, little kind of retreat type of, of station like a research station here mm -hmm. and he wanted he needed somebody to run it uh, like the manager or whatever and that was uh that was like my out man i was just like you know i didn't really ever think about living outside of america but yeah. i came here and i was already familiar with thai culture and i was yeah, i knew there was mushrooms here obviously it's a tropical country mm -hmm. And I just came here and I lived up in the jungle at this like research station. You know, that kind of romantic idea of like going down to South America and living in the rainforest and collecting yeah. plants. It's not like that at all. <laughs> it's yeah. living in the rainforest with no internet, no phone connection, no people to speak of, except for the ones you live with for right. days and weeks on end gets really really tedious so now what were this was like funded through the government this was privately funded right. what was your actual agenda at this mycology facility 
we were trying to do a bunch of the finding new species. Um, okay. Kind of mostly what I did was kind of host um, workshops. So, so that guy was a professor in Hong Kong, and he would end okay. up bringing his students as well as lots of people who would pay um, to to basically go collect mushrooms in the wild. Oh, cool. So we had like, gosh, we had like a, a girl, she came over with studying leeches, you know, mm -hmm. like the blood sucking leeches, yeah. which there are a lot of them. They grow here in the jungle, but they live on the trees. Okay. So when you walk past them, they'll like get on your arms and they really like wow. crawling up your arms and into your armpits. Sure. And like within the first like 24 hours of being here i had one on my testicles oh my and god that, that was a whole whole story i didn't know what leeches were and i i reached down my pants and i pulled my hand out and it was covered with blood <laughs> and i was like oh, that's a whole story yeah. and I, i'm the driver i'm trying to tell him in my crappy tie to please stop 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 like blood blood and I had this huge wow. spider co, like a four inch long, like razor sharp spider co, like a oh folder my in my pocket. And yeah. I thought I had cut my nuts. It was bad. It was really, really bad. And I was like screaming and all these wow. girls were laughing at me like, <laughs> like you mm -hmm. got a leech. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, thanks for telling me about that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, how we long did you, so how long were you at that facility? That was a year and a half of... Man, I, I really, uh, it's not as romantic as it seems living in the jungle sure. because the, because, because, you know, the world has encroached on every, you, there's not a, a place on earth where there's not a road. There's right. not a coffee shop. There's not somebody selling food. The, the, we had to really, really look. I mean, we were, this was up in Chiang Mai, which is closer to what would be the wilderness. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we really, really had to look for places to find mushrooms that weren't somebody's backyard wow. or somebody's, uh, you know, somebody's like cattle pasture, like that, you know, people aren't too keen on you, like just wandering around on their private land, even here. So we would we would end up going to these places that were so picked over that we couldn't really find a lot of a lot of stuff. And that that facility shut down after I think it man, it's been shut down for probably a good 10 or 15 years. Um, but we did we did end up I ended up meeting some nice people and I, I live with some people that I, I I'm still in contact with, but mostly it was it was lonely. Mm -hmm. And um I mean, even if you love mushrooms like I do or like Alan does and like there's only a certain amount of isolation that a typical person when yeah. you're used to the modern conveniences of like the Internet and, you know, your mobile phone and right. talking to other people, it, it gets really lonely pretty quick. I, I yes. was always a wreck. Thinking, always thinking about the jungle is easy. It's easy to romanticize the jungle. And then if yeah. you've actually walked through a quarter mile of the actual jungle with a machete where you're actually just simply uh, trying to move exactly. through, you know, untouched landscape, it, it, it doesn't take long to fall out of, out of love with that stuff. Yeah, totally. But it's cool. And those it looks good on your resume, right? I, I, I imagine yeah, it, the leeches on the nuts are kind of not so nice either. Yeah. <laughs> my uh, my wife did a, a, a trip to the Amazon, do like some like mission trip, and uh, uh, they slept on a houseboat, right? Because they were in this Amazonian, you know, fairly primitive uh, village, and uh, so they're sleeping on the houseboat, and they all have these like little gauze tents over them. Yeah, the mosquito and, nets thing. And she's like, she woke up one night. It was a full moon. She woke up, and the entire tent was just covered. She's like, the smallest bug was like this big. Mm -hmm. So it was just covered in the most massive insects you've ever seen in your life. And she's like, yeah, it, you know, it was an experience, but it, yeah. it didn't take long for her to be like, yep, I'm ready to go home now. Oh, get me man. back to Manaus. Get me man. just somewhere. Totally. Yeah, yeah. When you're sitting in an air, can, you, I like watching like David Attenborough documentaries now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. Those guys yeah. are like hands and knees down in like a fire ant nest. It's like, yeah, I like watching that on YouTube. Yeah. Thank Glad you I for don't doing do that. that. Yeah, sitting for, you know, 48 hours to get like yeah. a three second shot of a cheetah, like, you know, Correct. A gazelle. Like, I don't really want to do that. 
podcasts are way easier. I'm in my air conditioned like bedroom. This is nice. Yeah, it's the way to do it. <laughs> okay, so I've had a few questions in the in the um oh yeah the, the, the chat here um i think people are interested so okay you, you did a little growing basic cubes you know it, at, in ann arbor and michigan um not not so much during the phd um get us to um from the the jungles of thailand to what your day job is now and um and, and then what your night job is now well, my, I, I've kind of turned into pretty much a full-time <laughs> farmer now. <laughs> uh, I did teach classes. I, I'm at a, a fairly large academic institution, and I was teaching classes. But I, as you often do, I had some personal issues with my coworkers. So they decided what? to basically say, oh, yeah, it's hard to imagine, right? Uh, I'll uh, never what? have problems with coworkers. No, that'll never happen. A white guy you know, in Thailand? Oh, I can't uh, imagine they had problems with you. Well, that's the ironic thing. It's the two other white guys that I have trouble with. They're the, they're the ones what? that I have trouble with. There's a little bit of ego, you know. Holy people have shit. These things, like egos that like, I don't yeah. know, they're narcissistic sometimes. It's really weird. I, I don't is. quite understand yeah. it yet. But uh, yeah, it happens. And so they took away all my classes. So about two years ago, I'm like, fuck y'all. I'll just grow mushrooms. <laughs> so but so now i, I thought to, you that, told me you had tenure so are you still well that's their problem <laughs> i like that that's a great Who knows? situation Maybe to after be this in. podcast it'll be my problem but um yeah. <laughs> no they they uh they uh you know they're in the academic world there'll be like one yeah. guy i work with who will see it and he's down but um but yeah they they uh like I said, I'm really close to retirement. You can retire at 50 here, which means basically you got enough bank to like pay for visa fees and they right. know you're not going to scam the government or you're not some right. wanted criminal. So as long as you got like a bit of money in the bank, they don't mind you staying. Gotcha. Um, and, and I'm, I'm really like we were talking about, I've got like 50 ideas about where that'll go. And the whole, the, the thing here, I, I mean, just to, to note that, you know, weed is fully legal here now. Right. So Thailand is becoming quite progressive and I imagine mushrooms aren't far behind. So I That's have great. tried to hone my, my cultivation skills. Mm -hmm. um, really, I, I guess I'm like simplify. I've tried to like, so cumulatively I've been growing various kinds of fungi for like 30 years mm -hmm. and I've tried the monotubs and the shoe boxes and the bags and the BRF cakes and the spore syringes and the L I've kind of, I think kind of done it all now. And I've, what I've tried to do is basically get a system now. Um, I don't want to say too much, but the room that I'm in now, I have an identical room adjacent to this, which is basically a grow room. Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to be able to do is is teach people how to do what we do in the most kind of efficient, um, yeah. I guess, you say parsimonious way, instead of trying all these different techniques that may or may not work, which are are can work for some people mm -hmm. and some people may prefer. Um, maybe just start off like we were talking last night, like give somebody a bag of spawn, fully colonized, no bacteria, yeah. no trick, trike, and just give them a bag of spawn, tell them how to make substrate, CV, CVG, no poo. Yep. And just yep. like, be like, go get, here's a block of quar and here's a bag of substrate, figure it the fuck out. Yep. And if you can figure that out, it's we'll talk about and we'll talk about monocaryons and we'll talk about, you know, making your new strain or whatever. But if you can't get this block of quar that yeah. costs like three bucks and this bag of spawn, which costs like, what, 50 cents? <laughs> like, if you can't get that to work, we need to go like maybe you should like, I don't know, take up like, you know. I don't know. Chess. Or yeah, chess. they can join your they can join your chess club. Yeah, yeah join the <laughs> and chess get shunned club. from that. Yeah, yeah. I got shunned from my own chess club. I wasn't nerdy enough. I know they were yeah. like, "What you like? You don't really care about this." I'm like, "Yeah, I just wanted to like meet people. You guys are nerds." Yeah, it was a leisure activity. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, it's like a. I, uh, do you remember when euchre was a big deal in Michigan? Like, Yo, little, oh, like, my God. People got so hardcore about dude. euchre, man. Oh, my God. These are like games. Euchre. You're supposed to just hang out with people and just play games. It's not, it's oh, not good to carry it away. 
Yeah. I forgot about that game. Oh my God. Yeah. It's bringing like that's PTSD right there, man. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. So, so you're more, uh, so you're more recently growing cubes more seriously. Now, unlike yeah. our last guest who's talking about wheat and over here, we like popcorn and we like oats and all that stuff. You were telling me that, you know, grain options are different. So talk a little uh, bit about what grains you run and, and what options you have in, in Thailand. That's getting interesting because I just wanted I was going to mention that um, popcorn here. So I noticed another fella on another podcast. He kept dif he kept saying cor popcorn and then he would go to corn, corn, yeah. field corn, like and field popcorn. corn. Not the yeah. same. Not the totally same. different animals. Like I've done field corn here, which you can get really, really cheaply. It doesn't work well. It's mm -hmm. starchy, grainy. It it's just a mess. It blows up and turns into some yep. like it looks like that. What how many like grits? Right. Popcorn here, which I can buy for about a buck a key, a buck a pound. Oh, what is it? I got to convert between bot and kilos, and it's about a dollar a pound. Let's say a dollar. That's about pound. what I pay. A little less than that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's cheap and it's for human consumption and it's right. so clean. I did some, you got to boil the heck out of it, you know, for like yeah. God, I pro at least an hour. But I did a, I did a two pound batch the other week. And when it hydrates, it gets quite big. So yeah, you end up take on with, some water. Yeah, 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 definitely. And and even I, I kind of burst them a little bit, you know, just to make sure they're hydrated. Um, and that works great here. Uh, we can also get millet buckwheat but it's a little bit expensive and i don't i don't really like i've had bad experiences with millet okay. um even some of the commercial like mushroom farms that grow oysters the the same farms will sell you pre uh, pre-sterilized and, and pre-inoculated jars they're, they're kind of like you know those enoki jars they do with the, oh, right. Japanese, the, the white jars with the little tiny hole in the top they'll sell you those jars for like about i don't know about a quarter that are supposedly pre-sterilized but i've had to re-sterilize them and half of them go bad uh, they don't right. they don't uh, they don't quite they haven't even figured it out and they use it on a commercial level um, but but yeah uh the other thing patty rice do, do yeah you were telling me you're patty. using patty rice mm -hmm. which i imagine I is not far off from uncle ben's although i imagine it's a whole yeah. grain right it's, but you yeah it's basically brown grain, rice though. that still has the the uh, the husk i guess you yeah. call it so it's kind of um like it it's it's almost like a sunflower seed that didn't be like you didn't take out of the head it's still got sort of the husky part on it right. I, get, I don't know how to i wish i had a picture i'm sure you could pull it up on the internet or something but yeah it, i mean that's really a, that's why i never messed with uncle ben's as i just said to myself i get the logic of the whole and in the 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 reason you want the whole and you know, keep moisture in, you have a dry exterior. That seems, it just seemed like a good idea. That way I'm making my mycelium dig in there and mm, do yeah, a little work. Well, this one, it actually has, it's, it's even further than brown rice. So there's like three or four levels of rice milling where, so in, if it were in wheat terminology, the stuff is called the chaff, the right. C-H-A-F-F. -F. So the yeah. chaff is still on the rice. So then underneath so if you take off the chaff, you end up with what they call brown rice. And then right. if you take off that, like, uh, I don't know, kernel or whatever, that's right. when you get white rice. But they even take it a step further and they take off the germ and the brand. Oh, the brand, yeah. the brown brand. stuff is called brand. brand, I think. And so there's these different steps. And here, the cheapest one and the ones that the mushrooms like the best is just the straight up. They sell it as chicken food. Um, and I can get like a 20 pound bag for like $4, like a huge, I mean, bear, right. like I can carry two of them and it, it's a, it's a little bit of struggle. I put, throw them on my motorcycle and just mm -hmm. like, you know, whatever, but, um, yeah, cheap as dirt. And like the, they think you're just feeding chickens with it. So it doesn't right. really arouse any suspicion. And mm -hmm. I, I've even tried to tell the lady I buy it off. I'm like, yeah, I'm growing like magic mushrooms. And she's like, Hey, what, what are those? I'm like, yeah, yeah like. They don't have a clue. Right. They're just like, what? Um, I'm like, yeah, chicken food. So they fight cocks here. So she thinks I have like this big, <laughs> like gambling, and they gamble on them. Right. So they, she 
she thinks I'm some big like uh big like gangster, like I've got like all these fighting chickens. Oh my god, like, that's hilarious. 10, 20 kilos a week, and I'm like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guys are always like, Where can we go fight? We, we want to go fight with you. You know, they got they all got chickens. Yeah, they, they got money, they're bringing a hole in their pocket, they want to bet on your cocks. Yeah, exactly, yeah. man. Oh, these guys, they got chickens that cost like a thousand dollars, like one chicken. They're these mm -hmm. crazy, super like Terminator chickens, you know, and they put like all that business on them. And yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's not a, you know, it's, it's not something it's you want a, to like take your girlfriend to it's, see. It's not America. <laughs> yeah. And they still, not they America. do it. It's, it's like a sport here. They've got like magazines about it and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, right. so I grabbed these bags uh, of, of rice and then I just, I just boil them. I tried to pre-soak, no soak, putting them in the bags. I use bags too. I also use these really cheap polypropylene bags. They're unfiltered. Mm -hmm. They're just basically your standard, like a like a turkey bag or whatever they, right. that yeah. what they call. Them? Mm -hmm. And they're they're dirt cheap here. They sell those by the kilo too, because the plastics industry is like uh, kind of a bit out of control here. Right. So I buy these huge bags that are um I think they're eight, what are they? Eight by Eight by eleven inches, I think. Yeah, it's good and, size. Yeah. Oh no, 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 no. They're bigger. They're eight, eighteen by twenty-one. I, I don't know. I just buy the same, same size. They're quite big. They're, they're probably about this. Like maybe, yeah. They're about that. Um, and so they'll fit a good pound or two pounds of spawn in there. And by cool. the time I do my spawn run, um, sometimes I do LC, sometimes I do straight from the agar plate, and. Uh, yeah, man, they'll they'll colonize whether it's popcorn or the rice. I had a pop. I got a popcorn bag sitting outside. They colonized in like maybe six days. Yeah, crazy fast. And I just put like maybe a. I uh, love popcorn. popcorn. Yeah, me too. That's why I was a little yeah. surprised this guy was dissing on popcorn because I think popcorn's great. It, yeah, it works great. great, and the yields are good. And to be fair, when you're mixing it with sub, it's a little bit easier to get it kind of homogenized, you know, because right. there's, I don't. Yeah, with point. millet, I always end up with a pocket of just yeah. like pure millet clump somewhere mm, that, that I exactly. thought I got and I didn't get it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then, I mean, I yeah, still yeah. love millet. Don't get me wrong. But it's, it's a, I think, grand scheme of things. I really enjoy. There's the pluses to popcorn compared to the negatives of popcorn. I that that's currently my my go-to and then now i don't know if i've ever gotten you to try um my buddy uh stunning 21 on instagram he told me um he's like put a little corn syrup so now instead of boiling popcorn you can actually pressure cook it do like a 15 to almost 20 minute pressure cook run and it saves you time but anyway during that first pressure cook just you know popcorn in the open pressure cooker with three inches oh, of water yeah. above it. Um, he would put in like a shot glass worth of corn syrup. Mm. So he's like infusing as, you know, so he's basically now he's got some sugar water and he's infusing then that sugary water back into the, the corn. And if you thought six days, try three or four days. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, it speeds it up. Plus, I mean, it's corn syrup. So you're just, you're, you're sending it back to its home. You're just putting it back where it belongs, man. And man, and, I only grow halal, kosher, non-GMO. Right. Yeah. I, I okay. got <laughs> well, then if, you if can get some Korean that, corn syrup. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, you can. I'm sure they got kosher corn syrup over there. I'm sure you. I can don't want to ruin my rep, man, for my organic non-GMO uh, sure, products. You know. Sure. <laughs> yeah, but if you're grown with corn, yeah, you've already done that. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's too late, man. People are like, I don't want to eat GMOs. It's like, ah, too late. Yeah, sorry, uh, you should have been bringing that up like 15 years ago. So, just a quick uh, Kyle Cannon for those of you tuning in who uh, weren't here in the beginning, um, we had a little technical glitch with um, with Alan. He uh, so during the day today, he was doing a forage uh, foray. Uh, I believe I thought it was Humboldt County, but I, uh, anyway, he checked in a few minutes late and he was in the back of a car. He had terrible reception. There was a big delay and uh, he was basically like, yeah, I'm really sorry. You know, things ran behind. Let's reschedule. So, um, 
Luckily, my buddy who was going to uh, do next week's podcast, I, I woke him up and said, hey, man, you want to uh, you want to come on a week early. So we got Ed Grand. Uh, he so I'm going to have to update the the information because for a hot second here before I update it, it's going to say Alan Rockefeller, but we're going to have the podcast with Ed here. Oh. So anyway, now that everybody watching kind of knows what's going on. So yeah. Ed Nobody is disappoint anybody, you guys. I, I was li I was looking forward to Alan, too. Yeah, I mean, we all were, but that's okay. I was looking forward to this. I definitely wanted, I had planned on doing a little more prep for it. So this is a little spontaneous, but hey, you know, people oh, want a good. podcast. We're going to deliver a podcast. So um, yeah. anyway, uh, so anyway, for those who are just joining uh, to recap real quick, um, Ed has a PhD in mycology uh, with a focus on taxonomical consideration of uh, the, the genus uh, that shiitake mushrooms are under. And so um, he spent a little time talking about um, both his life growing cubes uh, as an undergrad at the University of Michigan. And then now uh, he lives in Thailand uh, and up until recently taught classes at university uh, science classes. And now, um, Full time, like the rest of us, uh, you know, gro growing cubes uh, on the down low. So he um, he uh, is, I think, a very interesting figure because he he bridges this gap between you know the hoity-toity ivory tower academic world, which he was a part of and and has left more or less, um, but has all that expertise and background, and then now also is a, a part of the the home cultivation community. And uh, I think it's really interesting to have a guy like him who, you know, chops it up with Dave Wombat and, you know, feels that a lot of at-home cultivators still have uh, plenty to teach uh, the academic world. And so um, it's, it's really cool to have him because I can ask him questions that I couldn't, there's nobody else in the community I could ask these questions, like very high level taxonomical questions and stuff like that, that he within five minutes, he's already lost me and I have to do like two weeks worth of research to, 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 to That's understand. Right, right, not... Yeah. Um, anyway, so, okay. Everybody, well, hopefully we're caught said, up. You know, that being said, th these home cultivators should not, I, I don't, that should not be thought of as like a derogatory term at all. I agree. A lot of the academics, you know, where they go to find all their all their like little tips to how to grow their research <laughs> specimens. They go to places like the Shroomery. Right. They're like, they're like, oh, I didn't know you could do this with brown rice flour, and you'd be amazed. They'll try to sneak it under another like, oh, well, a reference to this article. But really, right. you, it, when you read it, you're like, oh, they they I remember that thread from the Shroomery. Right. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, sometimes the way they word it, they word it so ambiguously that it's almost like, oh, they're just like blatantly telling you they don't want to tell you specifically how yeah. they did that. Like they're not even, it's kind of obvious uh, that they, they yeah. want to leave, you know, it's like the Coca-Cola recipe, right? Like yeah, exactly. uh, herbs and spices, <laughs> right? Like we won't yeah. tell you exactly what's in it. It's food so you can consume it. Right. Yeah, that what I, I is it called gatekeeping in the in the kind of amateur yeah. community? I mean, that's what I call it. it. Yeah, get a yeah, I really despise that to be honest. Um, I don't know. Maybe I mean, that's what this podcast is all about is is to the free I, sharing I and free it. flowing of information. My belief, if anybody has not heard me say this yet, um, we are an underground, small, very niche, very isolated community. Um, we're on the cusp of that potentially changing. And I think the way we represent mm -hmm. ourselves and the way we uh, hopefully band together and can elevate this work, it's good. it brings integrity to what we're doing rather than it being this, this shady, ugly thing that, you, you know, uh, as Ed was saying, you know, back in the day, he wanted to get a PhD studying cubensis, but that would be shunned upon and, and unable, you know, now I feel like you, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if some of these uh, well-funded, but under uh, utilized myco programs aren't going to start doing these ads. Like, are you growing mushrooms in your basement? Yes. Join our PhD yes. program. Cause you're the exact, cause the truth is, I don't know That's what it. your experience exactly. is. But enthusiasm in at the PhD level is fucking everything. Like you have to have enthusiasm because mm, exactly. it's a lot of work. 
Yep. You're going to be doing it for the four years at least and probably the rest of your life. So you yeah. better be enthusiastic. That That is, again, what differentiates most of the master's people from the PhD people. Well, yes, uh, that's PhD true. people are like obsessed with a certain topic and that's like what they do. Yeah. Um, masters are kind of less like, well, this is like two years of my life and then I'll get married and have kids and move on right. and what are you know? Um, but yeah, th there's also the, the academics know that there is this untapped resource, probably a lot of the people listening right now. And even here's another thing. It doesn't matter if you're 40 or 50 or whatever, how old you are. The academic world does not really differentiate based on your age. Once you're past undergraduate, I mean, I, I was in school with a, a guy from um, um, Costa Rica and he had three kids and a wife and and he was doing his Ph.D. And he just was I right. think he was 45 and, and it was, you know, a little bit harder <laughs> for him. You don't have to be like a spring chicken to go to school right. again. And a lot of people, you know, they get made redundant or they get laid off or whatever, like that, right. you know, maybe in the back of your head, like, yeah. wow, like I know a little bit about this stuff and. And do not underestimate like what the 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 pool of knowledge and the, the academics also they know there's people out there that know a lot of stuff. They just didn't go down the same path as you know, right. an academic might have. And and they're out there. Don't don't yeah. don't get discouraged by the term academia or whatever. Right. It's it's and especially when you're dealing in the cube world, you, you'll be surprised. Like some of the people I know personally who you would never, ever, ever think of like the guy, you know, that guy It's like, yeah. oh yeah, you are that kind of guy. You just got to get, I mean, the, for sure right now that's evolving. And you were the first person to mm -hmm. ever say this to me to go, okay. So like right now within this underground community, everybody for sure is going, there's a big tidal wave coming, you know, of interest in this area. And maybe there's going to be uh, pretty rapid decriminalization and or who knows, you know, the amount of scientific research that's starting to happen. So people really see like this big wave coming and they want to be a part of it. And it's fascinating how many people on a daily basis want to talk to me about their, their next business idea. But I never hear people say, you know, I'm going to go get a degree. I'm going to go, you know, I want to be, uh, I want to be an expert. I want to know more about this. And, uh, I, I am I am certain that there has to be a dearth of mycologists and or analytical chemists that if this wave really comes, which I do believe it's going to, uh, there is an opportunity to combine, you know, further furthering your academic career and, and then translating that into uh, some some important research, because like you said, there is a stigma still. And some of these old school scientists, they're maybe just not interested in, in, in that. And so it's going to take new scientists. It's going to take guys like Jordan Jacobs, you, yeah. you know, young guy who isn't afraid to go. I think he went to your old alma mater and rented a mass spec and was doing work with Zap Decorum. And, you, you know, this is like mm -hmm. the new way. I think there's really, particularly for mycology, we're going to start seeing a merging of the citizen science with the, the with the academics. Um, it, sure. And it needs to happen because the amount of work, I mean, Ed was just talking to me about, you know, F1s to F2s. And, uh, you know, once you go down the mono, uh, mono carry on rabbit hole, you know, boy, the workload just exponentially uh, increases, <laughs> uh, which maybe we'll get into a little bit here. Um but yeah, I think that's enough for people watching, you know, if you're really passionate and I talk to passionate people all the time who say things like, man, I've never had an interest like this. I want to make this my life. If people are saying stuff like that, I mean, should be considering mm -hmm. this. And dude, like you said, you send an email and a month later, you're, you're getting a free PhD. That's a very inspiring yeah, story. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, graduate school is not like undergraduate school. You, you're you yeah. pretty much free most of the time. And, and that's why that's why you get to learn so much, because it's kind of your job. Your job yeah. becomes learning. to learn. So you get paid, you get a stipend, you get your rent paid, you got beer money and you basically learn what you want to learn. Um, you know, and you can do any, I mean, it doesn't have to be fungi, it could be mosses or, or ferns or whatever, or, right. but if it's, uh, if it's something that you're passionate, that's, that's, 
that's something I think definitely a route to pursue that uh, a lot of people think it's going to be boring science class. Like, Oh God, I can't remember meiosis to be fair. If I had to, if somebody told me dry, draw the meiosis, whole prophase, anaphase, process, telophase, all yeah. that shit. Like I, I, I couldn't probably do it very well. I right. could kind of do it, but like, that's what the internet's for. Right. Like you don't really need to know what, you know, the last phase of anaphase, blah, blah, whatever. It, right. It's kind of irrelevant. When you start doing stuff um, that you're passionate about, you'll develop the the interests and the and right. the kind of routes you need to go. Yes. Um, if you do, Agreed. if you want to know about mating alleles, then you start reading about mating alleles, and then you become like the expert. And the, there is there is a, a lot of. Um, I mean, it could be good for some of the people in the community because it lets you develop your kind of ego because you will be the expert right. in that little sure. particular yeah. part of the world. Yeah. That's what uh, I mean. I remember my I mean, remember my advisor. He was like, you know, and after four years, you will be the expert on Lentinus. <laughs> And I'm like, you mean like shiitake mushrooms? I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? He's like, no, you will be the expert on Lentinus. And he was right. And I'm like, yeah. he also told me you'll get rid of all your old friends. No one will talk to you. Everyone will hate you. You'll probably have to move multiple times. You'll spend the, you know, the rest of your life trying to get grant money, which may or may not come. And yeah, pretty much he was like, yeah. The Ronnie, like, Ronnie boy nailed it. He he yeah, called it. Like, yep. He knew. Yeah. Why do you he think did. he was such and, an asshole? Yeah. Exactly. That, I think after he had forty-seven students, and uh, yeah, he knew the routine. Man, he's like, yeah. oh, come in and all, you know, you pie-eyed youth, and you're, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know what the fuck's going on, do you? Yeah. It was like a grumpy old man, but he was, yeah, he was a hundred percent right. Yeah, but I would I would seriously like get people out. Just start emailing people and just be straight up with them. The Here's the other thing: people don't got time for bullshit. If you want to know how to grow, you want to figure out how this substrate affects yields. Don't just be like, "Hey, man, I want to get high and grow mushrooms." Be like, right. go at them with like, "I want to figure out how you know tryptophan affects psilocybin alkaloid content." Right. Like, go at them like straight in with like what you really want to know because they might want to know it too. And right. they might be yeah. like, hey, I got like this $15,000 laying around here and yeah. a microscope that nobody uses and a DNA sequencer back here. And then right. next week you'll be down there like, what the fuck am I? Oh, I guess you'll I'm be living that Myco dream, man. Yeah, just like <laughs> that. And, yeah, it's, it's true. Definitely. For sure. Mm -hmm. You get all yeah. the Myco ladies, you know, they're. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> You'll get to go to conferences uh, with girls who study like bryophytes, like ferns, the mm, hotties, man, the mm -hmm. hotties of the fern world. Hi, my name is Fern, and I study ferns. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man, look at that protonema. Ooh, it's uh, so sexy. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> You're like, if you like my cystidia, wait till you see my pylocystidia. Yeah. I have oh, a collection my, of the most beautiful my, pylocystidia you've ever seen. My. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, a minute, uh, not too long ago, um, Phil Arid, uh, who is always good for some, some good comments, he was like, I get a boner when I hear big fancy science words. So I was like, oh. okay. Yeah. And, and Ed can say some words. I can't even say them. And I at one time was an English major. So that, that's how you know Ed knows some words. I don't know um, if I say some of them right, though, because I've only seen a lot of them written. And like, I, I bro, think I still say it's it. Latin. Agar it's a dead language. None of us know if we're saying it right. Yeah, right? Exactly. we don't even know. We don't. Know. Oh, yeah. I think somebody well, just posted. Oh, I think Alan posted about Rushala. Like I say Rushala because that's the way people said it in Michigan. Mm -hmm. But he says it Rushala. And I'm like, why is he saying it like that? It, like, yeah. it's one of those things, agar, 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 mm -hmm. whatever. It's like, nobody really cares. If you want to hear names uh, pronounce what you think is incorrectly, listen to, like, Russians or Chinese people try mm -hmm. to say, like, Latin, like, genus names. They'll be like, hygrophoris. And you're like, <laughs> what? Like, you mean, like, hygrophoris? Like, hygrophoris. It's like, right. what? What? <laughs> yeah, man, because <laughs> then, then you have, like, the accent layered on top of a dead language that yeah, no one knows how to pronounce right. anyway. Yeah. 
Go yeah, ask an Italian. They probably say it the best way. Yeah. Okay. So let's um, let's do. Uh, so okay, I, we'll, we'll get nerdy in a minute here. But I I did want to mention briefly. Um, you mentioned earlier, and I think it's worth talking about. And I expected to talk to Alan about this as well. Um, Alan uh, had mentioned to me, you know, people should make their own herbarium. They should start uh, collecting things. And if you're a smoker, uh, then you have something you can use your your cigarette packs for. But um, now, when I mentioned that, have- yeah, when I mentioned that to you, you were like, "Well, I mean, but it's not an herbarium." Uh, you know, you were you were coming from that. Well, it's not really an oh, herbarium, yeah. but but sure, um, if you can connect to an herbarium, I have one in Youngstown, Ohio. Mm-hmm. I can connect to. There's, I mean, I'm assuming the one at University of Michigan is a pretty substantial and impressive one in the grand scheme of herbariums. But yeah, if you're near one, I mean, you'd be a fool not to try to form some basic relationship with some of the people who work there and maintain it. And I mean, they're a wealth of knowledge. They're probably sitting around doing nothing half the day. And And yeah, exactly. If you showed an interest, they'd probably have a million things to talk about. Um, and they also would probably have some work if you're if you're interested in some oh, free yeah. labor because a lot of the the herbarium work involves data processing like putting numbers into a database so you'll have right. all your your boxes and they'll have an accession number and the collector and the location and blah 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 somebody's right. got to put that into a computer gotcha so and also a lot of the a lot of the herbariums now are digitizing so they'll actually sure. take a picture and then if they've got the funding they'll put it up on the web and all that kind of like iNaturalist but like a little more formal um right. because there's an actual number and like a like an actual specimen right um, there's a the very idea. serious methodology behind it yeah to, to, it's really right. um, yeah it's very tedious to be honest, yeah, that's a lot of academia in that or bear it's it's tedium like where you're sure. writing numbers and record keeping. And like we've mentioned, one of the things like me getting into the breeding with the monocarions, I've had to be really, really, really meticulous about yeah. labeling plates before I sub. Like so if I'm gonna sub uh, a multi spore from an F2 from this MVP cross golden halo, like I label the plate before I ever touch that scalpel. Because right. when you put that new piece of agar on the new plate, it right. starts to look like every other piece of auger. And that's why sometimes I use colors, not be, well, I like colors. Everybody likes colors and it's fun to, if I get a bad batch of plates, maybe I didn't PC them long enough. I know to check them all, you know, oh, the green right. batch is bad. But also when you sub, if you're subbing, like say I have a mono, it's on a green plate and another one on a red plate. I know. Oh, right. That, that helps. That's MVP yeah. mono. And yeah, it's just keeps you sane. Yeah. But the, mati- you know, Sharpie markers, oh. man, I can't. So it, it, in my profession, um, anytime I derivate from my standard order of operation of, of whatever I'm doing, whether I'm, you know, doing a bedside procedure or just administering some medicine or whatever, and I have to, maybe I have to mix an IV bag or something like that. The only time I make a mistake is if I have a standard way that I do something. The only time a mistake ever happens is when something causes me to derivate from that standard process. Mm. So, yeah, Yeah. I I always tell people, like, create a ritual. Like, that will guarantee you the more methodical you can be, the the less errors you will be making. Because, yeah, like you said, there's a point where you go – yeah, I don't know what that is anymore. And if you're playing a breeding game and you want to know what monos are crossing with what, and you really can't keep track of that, you're wa- it's wasted work. Yeah, uh, that it's almost doubly wasted because then you spend time trying to figure out what you did wrong or right. why, why something pops out and you don't really understand it. And then when you figure out that that that, that you did, right. it's like when somebody doesn't tell you the real story like oh i ate five grams and they didn't do anything to me but then you find out the day before they ate two 
and then you're they're not telling you the whole story it's like that frustrates the heck out of me um but yeah it's the same thing with it's record keeping when when you don't know the full story life can get very confusing really quick and it's a waste of time and it's a waste of work and then you just i i'm kind of like ocd about that stuff so i'll spend more time trying to figure out what i did wrong when i just yeah because you don't want to do it again yeah of course it's it's a really the wreck i see a lot of the the kind of casual talk about reading and stuff and sometimes people will be like i don't know i just like i can't remember what i crossed and it's like what (laughs) like what like they don't even remember what they did the ghetto swab Mm -hmm. or ghetto smash thing they don't remember what the two things were yeah i'm like that drives me kind of nuts i'm like yeah "Ah." and now so that goes along so we've we've had a few people talking about breeding on here and uh so you know my my buddy of uh lost paradise genetics julian matucci you know him and kylor and even yoshi are very much of the ilk of isolate monos you you've uh you just increasing your likelihood for clarity on what's happening um and and confidence in knowing what you're doing and the first time i you know i messed around with a uh, ghetto cross and I, i'm just like yeah I don't even know what the fuck I got. I mean, maybe I have something and maybe it's cool, but I can't officially say anything because I just rub two sticks together and <laughs> it's not very scientific. Can it make cool fruit? I mean, sure. I mean, I, yeah, I think yeah. a shit ton of the cool crosses we have were done using very rudimentary processes like that. Um, but if you're trying to do anything remotely consistent or scientific or uh, significant, you're probably not using those methods as much well to be honest it's a time and a resource issue too you know sure. if you're trying to do it cheaply i mean i i'm gonna i i got a couple things fruiting right now i'm probably gonna do a ghetto smash here i've never done one and i i didn't really gotcha. like I, we're saying i i didn't even really know like swabbing was a thing till like a year and a half ago because See, I, that's fascinating to me yeah but I but know. in that world you're not it's not necessarily about cultivating. I mean, maybe you're growing some mycelium out on some plates for, for a reason, but the amount yeah. of fruiting that it's probably occurring is in actual yeah. academic mycological mm-hmm. research is pretty low. Yeah. So and, and again, it's mushrooms. a time, it's a time thing. Um, you know, extracting DNA and stuff like that, it is quite straightforward, but it takes time. Yeah. Um, and so there's only you can't you know, there's only so many hands you have and so many hours in a day. And it, it's uh, it takes time to do all that stuff. And and when you're when your object is not to produce fruit, then that's not really what you're focused on. You know, if you, you can get a DNA sequence from any culture, you know, any dried up piece of fruit that you might mm-hmm. find or. Uh, a fresh mushroom, but when you, when you're not really into making fruit for you know whatever reason, because it's a little, little tiny like pleuritoid melanotis dark sport, like nobody cares right, nobody um, if you're gonna grow it or not. So you just pull DNA from the cultures. And, right, um, it's a time right. thing, man. I I've got a little overwhelmed. I know now, like you said, uh, I may have bit off a bit more than I can chew. To be honest, I, I'm I've got probably at least. 30 different crosses going and uh, I've, I've got probably six of them fruiting now and I'm looking at the phenotypes like that's cool but I want the spores to do the F2 which means I'm going to have to do another multi-spore and yeah. then isolate another dicarion and then make spawn yeah. and then fruit that and this is going to yeah. take like a month month and a half yeah. and I've got like 30 of those lined up <laughs> Right. Yeah, man. This so this is exactly why um, I've been so sort of my pet project has been this idea of uh, we need like a code of conduct in in this community. We need like ethical standards and things like this because I hear guys like Yoshi telling me like, look, man, when, when I finally put something out. I might have grown it six to eight generations back from spore. I've, I've, I've done a lot of work and, you know, for everyone that succeeds, I maybe have five to 10 that failed. And so when I finally put something out there only to have the very first motherfucker who buys it from me to immediately start vending it, you know, they're vending in the culture as soon as they can, they're growing it out. And then they're, they're taking a good clone culture and selling that. 
understandably, somebody might be upset. Now, yeah, I get nobody owns nature. You know, I, I, I understand all that. But at the same time, no one's mad about the nature. These cultivators that are doing a lot of work are upset because they've, yeah, it's like uh, I used to do bonsai. You know, it's a, just a tree, but obviously a master bonsai artist is doing something special with that tree to make it do a really unique, rare, artistic thing. And so somebody easily can spend ten to $100,000 in Japan on, on a prized bonsai. It's not because it's just a fucking pine tree, you know. It's because of all the work that, that that master has put into it. And I feel it's very similar for me to some of these isolations and crosses. Like you're, you're figuring out, there's so much work that can go into going, look at this truly new, um, where I, I'm going to let you talk about the, the word that you found. Ah, the cultigen. Cultigen, yes. <laughs> so when I first got into this, I got schooled multiple times by many people. Ah, it's not a strain. Stop saying strain. Oh, Strain's not the right. right word. You know, it's a variety or it's an isolation. Uh, cube is just a cube and this, that, the other thing. And you brought up this term. Um, I don't know. You can tell. I'm going to pull it up on screen, but you, you can talk about where you found this, how you happened upon this term, because I think it's a great term and I think it solves a lot of problems. Um, yeah, it relates to the, the terminology. I was actually looking into the terminology. Um, when we say F1, F2, uh, the plant people use the terms in a slightly different way. And I think even the fungi people, breeders use them in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of I was kind of sorting through when uh, basically the naming conventions. Also, when you make a hybrid, there's there's naming sort of can, they, like standard procedures for the plant people uh, with regard to what genus and what species and how you name it, etc. And I ran across this thing, cultigen. Um, and I have, I'm very familiar with that, um, that shroomery discussion. I don't remember who originally wrote it. I think it's, it's attributed to several authors, but the difference between variety, cultigen, strain, uh, not no, variety, strain, isolate, et cetera. Um, I think it would be nice to have a more generic term, but I don't know. I, I've never heard this term in the plant or the fungus world until I ran across this I think it was on Wikipedia, to be honest. Um, I, I'd never heard it in, in all my years of mycology and, and also a little bit of plant breeding. I'd never heard it, but it seems like a very appropriate term. All right, here, I, I got a better, I figured out a better way of pulling it up. Yeah. So yeah, there's this term, cultigen, a plant species yep. or variety known only within cultivation, especially one with no known wild ancestor. So mm. I don't know if you guys follow this guy on Instagram, Humble Mycology. Um, he does this really clever, amazing thing where he'll take a cubensis, you know, like a, a Yeti or a ghost or a, a giant Melmac, and he'll go and find this like gorgeous natural setting. Uh, he did one even on the beach and he had just like a little cluster of cubes, you know, seemingly growing in some beach <laughs> dune grass. And oh, it's just so clever and compelling to me because it, it really like triggers a discussion and an interest in, in, in these things because they're not naturally occurring. These are these things we have artificially, you know, it's very similar to dogs, right? There used to be some fucking wolves and we yeah. just kept breeding them and breeding them and breeding them and, and fucking with them until now we have all these, you know, like a chihuahua, if, if it can figure out the process can mate with, a, with a significantly dissimilar, um, variety of dog. And, and they assuming that the uterus of, of the female can carry it, you know, uh, uh, like uh, if you could get a male chihuahua to, to jump on the back of some female German shepherd, theoretically they can have pups, right? Cause they're the same species. And uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think that's interesting. So um, yeah. So cultigen guys, um, Ed's been using it. I've been trying to use it. Um, it's a, seems like an appropriate term for, um, 
for what we've been mostly describing as varieties. So, you know, Ape is a cultigen, uh, DC Mac 95 is a cultigen, um, Casper, Ghost, Yeti, you know, the list goes on and on. They're, they're obviously all just cubensis, um, but they are cultigens uh, that do not have a wild analog, so. Yeah, you know what, honestly, I think a lot of the, the the, the strain comes from the cannabis world. Yeah. They, yeah, um, so. the dispensaries here, they, they are insistent about, well, this is a 27% indica and like, a, a you know, for, a, for, I don't know where they get these numbers from. Um, they just, I, when I ask them, they just are like, I don't know. That's like what my friend told me. And it's like, well, <laughs> that's, that's your friend, the pot grower, like told right. you these numbers, <laughs> like the yeah. guy who sells you this stuff, gee, he might have a vested interest, kind of like a conflict of interest there. Yeah. yeah I got that 35% THC strain, man. Yeah. Yeah. You should buy this. Um, right. I wanted to, somebody mentioned on the side here, a tip of the cap and uh, another fellow, Jake, maybe, um, that we need teams of people doing these fruitings of the crosses. Uh, Agree. Like, I would love to see that happen. And if anybody out there wants, like, any of my stuff, I'm not doing really super interesting things yet. But if you're just like one of those people that likes maybe to see what comes from a ghetto cross, like, right. and you want a spore printer swabs, man, hit me up because it'll take about two weeks to get to you from Thailand. But the international mail, as we, as we know, it, it works perfectly yeah. well. You just got to be a little patient, maybe three weeks, depending on where you're at. But man, I've, I've sent stuff to like, you know. Dubai. Oh, I maybe I shouldn't say. Well, you know, places in the world. They're, 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 they Dude, the actually, people in Dubai, yeah. they're getting it all. They got money. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever I they want, get they're getting. Some of those yeah. trillionaires, man. We need those trillionaires. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Funding yeah. Our Ed and I were talking about all the trillionaires in, in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Just give so us all you Saudi ways. Arabian uh, yeah. uh, mushroom cultivators, reach out. I got I guess I, I'm gonna I'm gonna send something to a dude named Mahad or, la or later, so and maybe nice. he'll hook us up. There you go. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know about you. I have I have sent sterilizers all over this planet. Yeah, many many unusual uh, Arab countries, an insane amount of uh, stuff to to South American countries. Uh, um, yeah. And then, of course, many, many European countries. To be honest, uh, very, very few, I think just two Asian countries. So Asia, they don't need us. They've been fucking with mushrooms for years. So they, yeah. they probably are not as likely to be tied into to this community. They're, they're still a little bit afraid of the, like, you know, the psychedelic stuff here. Mm -hmm. They, they kind of, you know, they're, they're very spiritual in a lot of ways. And I, I think mm -hmm. they kind of, they're a little bit afraid of kind of tapping into that, you know, the netherworld that right. we're kind of, we're kind of happy to get, get in touch with. But some people here are still a little bit like, oh, that's like magic, black magic kind of stuff. Like, don't mess right. with that. Right. Like, might talk All right. to dead girl. Or something. Uh, Kyle says, how can I contact Ed? Um, so Ed is on Facebook. He is on uh, Discord um, and he has a YouTube channel. So right now in the description, it's all Alan stuff. I can't do this. I'm not going to do this while I'm live <laughs> no, trying to change it. But, but tonight when we're done, I'm going to swap the description information. So you guys will have a way of getting a hold of Ed. Um, let's talk a little bit um, since it sort of relates um, somebody was asking about, uh, they said they watched some of your YouTube videos. So Ed's putting out some great, uh, shorter videos that are kind of quick and dirty. Like he's got a ghetto, uh, serial dilution method that he's got a video for that, that I show a lot of people. Um, and he, he had another one that I tried now this, this one is obviously he, he, he prefaced it with, you know, this is like a field technique if, if you don't have a lot of other options, but, but I wanted to try it and I thought it was pretty cool where you take a fresh mushroom that uh, where the basidia are ripened and they're about to eject spores, but they have mostly not ejected all their spores yet. You would rip off a fragment of gill mm. and you would place it on a dab. So you take your Petri dish and the top of the dish, you would put a, either a dab of Vaseline or a, or a dab of hair gel. You place that gill fragment 
put the, the, the cover on, on the Petri dish, and then you set it at about an 80 to 90 degree angle. And the idea is that now that that gill fragment has been torn off of the, the fruit, it, it will eject those spores naturally. And uh, if you're lucky and you don't use too big of a piece of gill fragment, lesson I learned the hard way, um, it, it will splatter those, those spores out. And if you're, if you pay attention and catch it early, you can actually isolate monos that way. I failed with two varieties and succeeded. Uh, I got four isolations out of, um, uh, I think it was a Goliath PE. Um, so it, it does work. It's just, you know, stuff to try. If, if you're like me, I like trying things cause I know I build my skills when I try many different things. Um, mm. anyway, that works. So yeah, I'll make sure you guys have links to his, uh, YouTube channel. Um, and he is also very good. If, if you guys get in a talk and you bring up something, he goes, oh yeah, yeah, I can do a video about that. And then a day or two later, he'll have the video up. And so, um, he's kind of cool as far as, um, you know, he'll answer your question and make a little video for you. Um, that's not like a guarantee. I'm not going to put too much pressure on him, but that has been the case so far. So it's good. I, I just need ideas. Um, yeah. I, I sometimes I've, because a lot of things I do so routinely that I, I kind of don't think to make a video about it. But right. if, if it's something that like I can literally just set up the camera and, and just right. shoot it like I, I'm I, I'm not real. Um, I'm not real concerned about my physical appearance or, or like things like right. that. So I don't need makeup like or hairstyle no. or, like no. before I go on. So I don't really care. And sometimes the maid walks in while I'm doing videos. That's always fun. Sure. Yeah. 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 If you guys watch some of his videos, there's, there's one memorable time when his, um, the camera attachment for the microscope falls off, um, which is pretty hilarious. And then there's another one where a, a maid comes into the lab at the time. And, uh, yeah, so they're, they're very, they're very, uh, spur of the moment in, in organic videos. They're, you know, it's not like, uh, yeah. super, super like highly no polished. Rep. It yeah. takes me more time to set up the camera than the thought that goes into the video. I mean, right. I hate to say it, but that's how, like, I just like, is the camera working? Okay, let's go. Yeah. Kind of yeah. like now. <laughs> yeah, we just, yeah, we're doing it. Um, okay, so it? here's one from Qbert Benson. Cool name. Uh, when it comes, now I actually, oh, this might be my, my buddy from Discord. He's, it's a similar um icon anyway. Uh, when it comes to hybridizing cubensis varieties on an agar plate, what's the best practice as far as the plating process for the two monokaryotic cultures onto a single dish? What do you do? Yeah, this is this is a very good question because I was actually going to find a picture of what I do yesterday, uh, today, but um, but yeah, I don't want to go through for next week's photos. podcast that's happening right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, I don't want. I don't. Uh, my photos are mixed personal stuff and and fun sure. Stuff. No, we don't need to pull um, all that up. No, there might be some really really incriminating stuff on there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I uh, so what I do is uh, so I use what ninety centimeter uh, ninety millimeter dishes, the typical. Um, yeah out your plate and mm -hmm. i usually put them about maybe a half inch so i'll take like um a quarter inch size which is maybe like a, a pinky nail size of one sure. and mm -hmm. and i usually try to get a square but sometimes it's a triangle i'm, I'm not yeah. too particular about the size and shape and right how pretty it is as long as you get one monocarion and the other monocarion um i'll also do this sometimes when i have multi spores like i'll do different um where i think the spores are germinating and I'll put them onto a new plate and sort of mash them together like a chop, 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 kind of like you're making like, you know, I don't know, chopping garlic. <laughs> chop, 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 chop. Oh, really? One, okay. Yeah. So that if there are, I've had this trouble where sometimes you'll get a mono uh, on like, say your street, you do like, like just say you got a swab and you streak it, you'll get a bunch of monos. I'll take those monos and cut them out and put them on a new plate and mash them together like you're making coleslaw or chopping garlic okay. so that usually they'll dicaryotize and a dicaryon will pop out somewhere. And then I subculture right. that. Oh, okay. But with, as far as verified, you got, please, please, please. If you're going to do this, make sure you, you got to use a microscope. I was so this guy, I'm pretty sure he just bought like 
a, a, an amazing three thousand dollar Nikon E series. He's got. Uh, I mean, it's 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 not a DIC microscope, but it's a pretty banging microscope. So he's uh, definitely uh, confirming. You, you know, so he's got that. He, okay. Yeah, he's and through uh, a little bit the help of you. Yes. So he's already okay. doing this. So he's probably just trying to get to this next step now that he has monos. So the practical aspect. Yeah, I've, I've actually heard and discussed this with several people. What I do is literally I'll take two, put them about a half inch away from each other on the same plate and try to make sure they don't bounce. And, and if you wrap it with parafilm, I use food wrap now, like cling wrap, mm -hmm. uh, way better than parafilm. Parafilm is is old, annoying, old school, yeah. man. It's annoying, and I, I just use cheap cling film and whack right. it into like inch long things. Which you also <laughs> did a cool up. short video of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be really careful with doing that, man. I've almost I have cut myself twice, yeah. too, and I almost took my pinky off one time. But um, yeah, when you wrap it, make sure you don't get like try not to get, let the pieces bounce because if they bounce around, things get confusing. Yeah. And yeah. also, sometimes if you want on the side of the plate, <clears throat> put a mark like where you'll know the top and the bottom are, are connected. Oh, so you'll have on the lid, you'll have a black mark and on the bottom, because if you label it with say your, your mono carry on one on the left, you want to make yeah. sure you'll, you'll inevitably spin the lid at some sure. point. So m make a little hash mark on the side of the plate. And so that way you'll know which mono is, which not that it'll matter if it's a successful cross, but for right. later, sometimes one might be a contaminant. There's another thing okay. with mono carry ons that we don't really like to talk about is that they could be a contaminant. And if you have a contaminant, oftentimes they will of course be clampless. Um, but right. there are contaminants out there that will look a heck of a lot like mycelium cube mm -hmm. mycelium and that's a mess. So like so I might be trying to mate pin mold with a cubensis monocarion. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Okay. And unless it's something like aspergillus or penicillium that's going to sporulate yeah. rather yeah, quickly, you, you might. You I, I've done it. I've done it. I've, I've mated several things and the fucking one half of the plate turns green. I'm like, oh, that's nice. I just tried to mate trick with a cube. <laughs> right. That's right. cute. Yeah. I didn't get an intergeneric or a family. So, so yeah, I just, you didn't get just, the new trick hybrid. Everybody no, wants that. Yeah. I would, I would love yeah. that. Like, Oh, you can go trick and cubes at the same time. What? I already Man, know I people who can do that. So <laughs> oh, yeah. you, don't, you don't need a cross for that. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll put that on the back burner for now, but, um, but yeah, it's just about uh, keeping records and also the, um, the growth rate if you if you're in a hurry then you shouldn't be doing probably mono carry on crosses because that's yeah. that is the one it, it takes time and and they'll grow together if you put them a half inch apart and they're both from fresh cultures they'll grow together within a couple probably three or four days uh later on so then what i'll do is I, i'll i do something a little bit weird that i'm not even sure where or why i do it but i will take so, so imagine my little fingers, I got a mono carry on here and here, and there's an interface and that's where the dicarion should form. So what I will do is I will take the whole big chunk, like say almost the size of like half of that post-it note size where there would have been here. I'll just draw it. So here's M the first mono carry on and the second one. And I will just literally like take the whole bunch of it. Um, I will take both monocarions as well as the interface and I'll right. just sub the whole thing and throw. So what I'll do. So I don't know. Can you see yep. that? Yeah. So, and that, Maybe. that interface it is typically wider and more dense. It looks more tall. Yeah. And toast, whereas yeah, the monos exactly. tend to look a little wispier. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Uh, they tend to. I, so where, so where that interface is, that's where, you know, theoretically the dicarion will form. This might right. be backwards. I don't know. And then, so I'll sub that to a new plate, but then I will go in and I'll literally come and I'll cut out this whole big chunk. And I'll usually leave a little piece on the edge where there's a bit of interface. So that dicarion will lift it up, lift it out. up, lift Oops, it up. Sorry. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So the dicarion will kind of like squirt out like right, okay. right there. It'll like, so you'll have the old plate, which you'll still have the dicarion. And mm -hmm. then you put basically make spawn out of this entire big like block. So I'm doing this backwards with sure. the cameras. <laughs> I mean, theoretically, plate. it'll, the dicarion will take over, right? 
Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So. That is the key. So even if you have two monocarions in the spawn bag, when you do the mashing, when you and right. you mix the spawn, they will die. They will die. Not not die. They will die. Karyotize in the bag. Yeah. Yeah. So you can like basically save yourself about two weeks <clears throat> by just throwing it. And to be honest, most of the crosses are pretty ugly. <laughs> so you. Like when you sub that little tiny piece of the interface, oftentimes you'll get these really beautiful dicaryotic rhizomorphic colonies. And then you're like, oh, that's pretty. But the original crosses, they're ugly. Like you got two monocaryons and that interface, it gets all brown and crusty. And you're just like, that's not pretty. <laughs> and then when you sub that little, little, little tiny piece, just, you know, it only needs to be like a quarter inch size. Um, and that's the one that that's when you're like, oh yeah. And if you want to double check, you, you, you look for clamps on that. But if you get a nice rhizomorphic growth from the sub and you've already made spawn and you're running shoe boxes, like I am now, you're like, yeah, I already got spawn. Yeah. Maybe something will grow. Maybe not. Yeah. If not, I'll throw it away. Right. And now, so the, we started talking about this. I think this might be worth talking about, um, that in the beginning, so if you've isolated two monos and, and they have dicaryotized and, and you now you have half the genetic, the haploid uh, of two different varieties, two different cultigens, and they've now mated, there is that one genetic dynamic going on. And so that F1 fruit, that first fruit, yeah. like you just said, will look a certain way. And if you kept clone culturing that and you kept growing that, it would theoretically keep looking that same way. But then if you swab the fruit from F1 and yeah. then re-germinate those F1 spores for your second filial generation, um, and you, you had said, you know, Dave was talking about this on the podcast and you're now seeing this absolutely come to life. F1 yeah. to F2 can look radically different. And that's because sure. now you're playing the genetic lottery again. Your, mm -hmm. your, your, your options from those swabs are, are much, much greater. And you could keep going back. So let's say off your F1 swabs, say you made 50 swab sets. You could run literally all hundred swabs on a separate plate and, and fruit all hundred of those. And you'd probably be in pheno hunter paradise. Cause exactly. there, there, there would be oh. many, I mean, you would maybe eventually out of those hundred grows, maybe you'd have five very common phenotypic expressions, but, but you'd have many more than just that one F2 that you got. So that going back to F1 oh. spoke, is a gold mine. Yes, yes, exactly what you just said. And, and I, I'm still processing it. Yeah, in the F2 spores, or what? So it would be the F1 spores, which I think we can we call it F2. Is it like? Well, see, yeah. yeah now, now, now I'm using your education back on you because uh -oh, my thought uh -oh, is, uh -oh. if it's a spore <laughs> that hasn't germinated, there's no dicaryons on that spore yet. So for me, theoretically, I would not start using F2 or F3 until I had dicaryons on a plate at least, right? Oh, so that, yeah, that's, so that's exactly that's what I've been. So I started out labeling the, the multi-spores. I labeled them F1 spores. Yeah. And then when I've isolated a dike, yeah, I'm this, I think yeah. we're thinking the same way. I just, it's yeah. kind of hard to like, like tell it or speak it. So when I get a dicarian, I I was like, wow, like I'm not dealing with the F1 spore, multi-spore anymore. And now, so I think I can call this the F2 now. When yeah. I have a confirmed dicarion from the F1 spore, multi-spore, I think you can call it the F2 then. Yeah, like once you you've grown a, it. Yeah, once it's yeah, germinated. Yeah, once you got it yes. confirmed because right. it's going to, it's got a, yeah, yeah, you have an isolated dicarion now. So yeah. I think then... Because, yeah, that kind of makes sense, too, right? Because, like, in animals, you would call, yeah, you, when you have the living animal that's capable of producing gametes or spores or sperm right. or whatever, yeah, you would call that the F2, right? It's yeah. got the capability of producing the next generation. It just hasn't done it yet. Right. So you almost, I mean, this is where I'm, I'm using the logic that you've been teaching me. 
my thought is if I took an F1 spore swab, right, from a cross, and if I then streaked that, trying to isolate monos from my F1 for whatever reason I might want to do that, <laughs> those monos are still F1 monos. They are not F2 monos yet. F2 monos would be from right, the second fruit. Right, right. Good luck <laughs> labeling those plates. <laughs> yeah. But but so so this goes into um again maybe someone can find it, but I think this has not been entirely standardized. Uh even in academic level mycology. I think they just I come up with a process. And stick to it. So this might be a cool thing as I'm, you know, talking with all these very serious cultivators and trying to mm. come up with a standard, which I, I think there is a dire need for standardizing some rules of the game when it comes to yeah, naming yeah, yeah. things. And because I think I, I was talking to Ed earlier and I said, you know, like I could get something called roller coaster and I just don't know what the fuck it is unless someone actually tells me, you know, unless the guy who crossed it tells me what the fuck it is and where it came from. A cool name is not it's not as cool as you think it is. You know, maybe it's fun to name your kid, but uh, it, it's not helping out cultivation because I not can't tell you how many. I mean, anybody that's done this for any amount of time, how many times have you had a random dude send you a message that says, so what is avalanche across off? What is peacock across off? Where did Melmac come from? Like there are all these origin questions people are asking all the time. And my thought process, and maybe you can talk about this a little bit. This is like the whole point of taxonomy is to increase clarity and understanding on species identification and study and all this kind of stuff. And we're losing that by just going, I want to do a cross so I can name it Lex Luthor, man, or I want to do an Ed Gain cross. I want to do a whole series of crosses after serial killers. Dude, I get it. We smoke weed. We come up with all our best <laughs> ideas. I fucking get it. But like, we're not going to be helping. It's just like, uh, uh, dude, Dave Wombat was making fun of all these uh, strain names, right? He was having me rolling because he was just riffing on all these like imaginary strain names. It just ends up getting a little ludicrous. Yeah, it does. And I would love I, to know the same way that when Yoshi put out that tat family tree, I mean, people just fucking responded to that. Right. Cause it was a little bit of clarity like, Oh, thank you. I now have like a sense of where mm -hmm. these things came from. Right. It's not a phylogenic tree or anything like that. Um, it, it, but based on the history and his experience in tat, he was able to go, this is my understanding of where all this stuff came from. And people definitely found that useful. I'm when he first came out with that, people on a regular basis were like, Hey, where can I get that tat family tree? Hey, where can I get that tat family tree? Mm -hmm. Cause people want more clarity around this stuff. They want to understand it. Cause the people that get really into this, then they go, well, I want to be intelligent about my crosses. Right. Um, Julian just did a cross and, um, when I heard him start explaining why he chose to do these crosses, it's like, Oh, like he thought about this, you know, like there was a logic to it. And I think that stuff's really important. Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, I, w I wouldn't say it's also um, maybe just keeping track of what you do, even if there's no real logic to it, but, uh, but just keeping track of what you do in case you do right. find something interesting. So I'm kind of going like more the shotgun approach of like, not, not shotgun sequencing, but like, I.e. like I just got mono carry ons one day on accident, you know, kind wow. of an interesting story. I had an MVP culture that I thought for sure it was rhizomorphic, tried mm -hmm. to fruit the fucker three times. And after the third time, I finally pulled off a piece of the sub and looked and it was a mono carry on. Oh, and I was like, Oh, I have a very, very well confirmed MVP mono carry on that does not fruit. And I'm like, well, it's got to be a mono carry on. It, mm -hmm. But why is it rhizomorphic? Or I think Tyler called it pseudo rhizomorphic. Mm -hmm. I think that's another good term, I think. Yeah. Um, but I was like, I, I should do something with this. So I had another spore print and then I was like, hmm. And that was about maybe six or eight months ago, and uh, they multiply. But I wanted one more thing before we move on to the taxonomy thing is that 
even in the spore prints that people have laying around, even if it's just like a GT, you know, all that TAT stuff came from a GT. Right. Like Dave talks a lot about his original B plus still having all the, there is still genetics in these. So if you even have like, say you had a GT and a B plus laying around, you could just do a ghetto swab. It's that F one spore generation. That's where they've under, I hate to get like nerdy again, but you're a hundred. I know what you're going to say. When yep. those two monocaryons fuse and they undergo karyogamy and then they undergo meiosis in the basidia, that's the part I, I don't know if people out there know, but that's where the magic happens. Yep. The recombination. So you have literally taking two what are fairly stable parents and you imagine your brothers and sisters. This is the one I like to use. You don't look anything probably like your brother or sister, right? That is the F1 generation. And so if you could somehow take you and your brothers and sisters and isolate them and put them under standard fruiting conditions or whatever nutrition, you might get right. completely different phenotypes. And that's in just the F1. So like you're saying right. about getting monos from the F1, I'm not going to go there, man. No, yeah. no way. Because... Yeah. But you can. Do but this, this is also of- this is also why when you hear some of these serious cultivators say stuff like, "Oh man, uh, Dave just sent me an old original swab yeah, from yeah, his yeah. first this that uh-huh. and the other thing," <laughs> and I, I used to like when I was first getting into this. Oh, okay, cool. He sent you an old swab. Who fucking cares? Now right that here. I'm getting into the genetics of it, I'm like, that's all I want. Really, like. Jip yes, Fibs exactly. is going to give me uh, like the original tat swabs. Fuck yes. What else can we do? Yeah. Or like you just said, like no one's going back to the original old school shit that all this new school shit came from. Mm. The, and the going, land races or whatever. Go back that... to the land races. So, you know, you got yep. guys like Yoshi now and Julian's doing this where Julian just crossed ghost with um, a wild found, uh, cubensis from floridian swampland and so he calls it swamp ghost and Mm -hmm. they're trying to do that now they're going yeah man you know some of that genetic variety um this is where it all came from so let's get it back and let's not you know be like that that amish kid with webbed feet and you know which some of these weird cool looking fruits but you know they're sporeless they're they have to be you know always clone cultured or Oh my God, I just grew Casper, which is one of my new favorite varieties to grow. Um, shout out to uh, uh, Wesson 5000, I think it is. Um, he, uh, he's he got a really cool little variety going on. and uh, But man, I got to hunt like a motherfucker to find a couple spores on the thing, right? It's like a, it's a, I have not successfully gotten a spore to germinate from it yet. So I got to keep cloning the culture to keep it going, right? These are things that... Spores yeah. are cool. The more you're going back to spore, the more you're playing the fun game of uh, you might find something really cool and you might not even have to cross a bunch of shit to get it. Exactly. man. you know, I, I think Dave posted a, a picture one time. He had this big box of just spore swabs. And I was the same idea. Like, God, like, wouldn't you throw those away? I mean, you're fucking Dave Wombat for fuck's sake. Wouldn't you throw yeah. that shit away? Nope. And then no, 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 no. And then I started thinking about it like, oh, my gosh, he could pull out like one of those swabs and probably create like six new cultigens or whatever here's you know. here's what it's like i i just so imagine you buy a lottery ticket every day right and, and you don't win and you don't win but you save all your lottery tickets and then yeah. one day they go we're gonna do a new thing where we're gonna announce winning numbers and you can use any of your past lottery tickets to win so now maybe you got a stack of ten thousand lottery tickets right that's literally what these i mean i'm new telling you that's like my wife. She keeps saving her lottery tickets like they're going to change the numbers. I'm like, can you throw those away? Didn't you check them already? Oh, she's got like a stack nah, of man, them. That's, that's good luck. Maybe I that's mean, what she's looking forward to. It's they're good luck. Change the luck. Yeah. Just <laughs> randomly yeah. pull up lottery. April yes. 17th, 1920. Oh, no. yeah. But yeah. But yeah so I originally thought, okay, the Basidia, their <laughs> Tetrad, they make these four spores. So for some reason in my head, I thought, oh, it's just four possible outcomes. And then uh, somebody finally explained to me that, oh, no, it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's not necessarily infinite, but it's crazy. Uh, like 
it's way a more than you could ever grow. Then you could L- ever like possibly said, imagine. One of those original TAT spore prints, like you could work with that for the rest of your life, probably. Rest of your life. One single pile of spores. Yeah. And that's not even, that's like an F1 or whatever. It's like, that's not yeah. even talking about F2s and F3s and it blows the mind. Right. And, and one thing I'd also like too is like, not everybody needs to like work with albinos. <laughs> like there's some really cool phenotypes. Like, I don't know why there's this, like, I like to, I'm going to coin another term, myco racism. <laughs> <laughs> like people don't what's that what's wrong with brown cubes, it's it's man? that potency dude it's no that, it's that okay. potency oh, okay. they it's we're, we're, it's we're too getting, it's, it's too synonymous with potency ah you know why because yeah. you can see the blue color more easily on a white background oh that, i said it yeah. oh oh yes. oh snap yes oh. seeing the no that's totally true right like Every time I see, uh, man, when I cut this Casper or some of the gnats that I grew recently, I mean, they blew to black like a fuck blue on. There's a phrase I learned in DC Max uh, Discord. It was they said blue on break. You snap that stipe, that motherfucker turn, turns blue like that. Now, of course, you're you're oxidizing your psilocybin. <laughs> that's not great. Yeah. But boy, it makes you feel good, doesn't it? You're like, fuck, I know these like that's oh. an easy sell. Look at that. You want some of that? Yeah. Of course you do. Oh, I had a yeah. I had an albino gumby and I, I just sliced it down the middle because I saw some and yeah, immediately I was like, Oh, that is pretty. Yeah. And I was just like, Yeah, you don't get that with a brown cube, but I don't know, man, you know, you like seven, ten to ten grams of any brown cube, man. You're you're they're there. It's um, I mean, it's all psilocybin. Sure, there's some analogs yeah. and some 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 this and that, and maybe some beta whatevers and you, you know, we can, we can go down the rabbit hole, but at the end of the day, the bread and butter, right. Where whether it's ethanol 10 or it's uh, you know, high octane or low octane, if you put gas in your yeah. tank, it, it's going to make it your goes. car go guys. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, it's funny here. There's actually a more of a preference for the more natural looking stuff. Like if you show somebody uh, like an albino, even, even like the, the albino Avery's or Avery's albinos, like people mm-hmm. don't, what they are like they just don't know what they are right. at like they they always want gts b plus hmm. and they do not really even know like the the only people who would know what an ape or enigma were would be like white people on on tour on like they're on they're, they're like right. tourists like and if you hand them a bag of like gt and or whatever the hell brown ones you got laying around and be yeah. like these are golden teacher yeah here you go yeah. they but they're not gonna they're not going to complain you know yep. you had you had somebody five grams of that they're, they're not going to complain. i forget if it was you or it might have been i forget who i think somebody else said this first but i think you have said this um where it's just like uh in this this just eternal quest for more and greater potency um at the end of the day all you got to do is ingest more yeah exactly i mean i think if i was growing at scale I don't think I would, I mean, I would run experiments, but I'm pretty sure the most basic vigorous cube, I'm finding the variety that grows the absolute fastest I can possibly mm. find. And then I'm just turning that shit over as quick as I yeah, possibly yeah, can, exactly. right? Because it's all psilocybin. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's much validity to uh, thinking much about trip reports other than for their ent- entertainment value. But, you know, everybody's got this great story about KSSS or uh, Golden Teacher. Oh, my best trip was B+. Plus. And, and usually it's like, oh, that was your first trip, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, cool. Well, yeah, cocaine, my to... first cocaine was fantastic. Yeah. yeah, and then it ruined my life. Yeah, right. Or people don't even know how much they eat sometimes. They're, they're like, sure. people. most people don't have accurate scales. So they're like, I don't know, I ate like a handful I'm like, well, that could have been yeah. a gram, five, six, eight. What I don't know. Like, yeah. and yeah, I kind of gave up on the trip reports a long, long time ago. Yeah. Also, I mean, some people can tell some one, you know, it's uh, it's a creative skill for sure. And I have a friend who she started oh, uh, for a while a separate IG account and did nothing but do you know, these very, very eloquent trip reports. And they were entertaining to read. And I'm always fascinated by by hearing a well-written trip report, 
but it's it's never going to be used as like, oh, okay, cool. Well, that was her experience on Enigma, so that's going to be. I mean, it doesn't work that way. But yeah, well, and like you were saying also about the HPL set, the HPLC testing of even fruits on the on the on the different parts of the tub oh, yeah. and the tray. I Very mean, if you by got like a factor of three in the same tub. Man. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. pins, you know, the best trip I ever had was on like five grams of aborts, Amazonian aborts. <laughs> oh, yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. I was like, yeah. oh, I that was, you know, 30 years ago. And I, it might only been like three and a half or four grams of aborts. Oh, my God. I was so yeah. gone. Like I was getting like auditory hallucinations. I thought like, I oh, heard yeah, that's, sirens. that's the that's the <laughs> highest level right there. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> that's when I knew that's when I was really happy, like three hours later when I like came back. I'm like, wow, that was scary as hell. Like I gonna not do that again for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna stick with my joints and my alcohol for a bit. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, it's like DMT, right? Yeah. I mean it's 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 yeah. a it's a significant experience sometimes for mm. sure. All right, so let's do. Um, I mean, we're we're already two and a half hours in, but let's oh, just yeah. let's give people a taste. Um, so, as someone, you know, your PhD was in taxonomical. Can, let me let me read it here. Hold on, I got it. Let oh, do you, you mind if I take a pee real quick? Yeah, uh, go for it. I'll be okay. I'll, I'll be like thirty seconds. He he did almost as good as a good fun guy. Um, who currently holds the record for most pee breaks. Uh, I love you, good fun guy. Um, so, okay, while he's doing that, um, Ed's PhD was in systematics and species concepts in the general Lentilis FR and Panis FR with emphasis on the Lentilis Tigrinus, uh, blah, 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 complexes. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so the whole PhD was about taxonomical considerations. So this guy knows a lot about... Um, you know, uh, just taxonomy, which is the study of how do we name uh, things, you know, within kingdoms and phylums and genuses, species, classes, all that stuff. And the, the ways that certain traits within, you know, a kingdom or a class or a phylum, whatever. Um, so yeah, a little, little heady, a little dense, um, but he's got a sophisticated understanding of how things get uh, identified as a, a given genus or species or even phylum, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> so coming into the Cubensis growers community, he's, you know, noticed a few things and has uh, a few thoughts. And so I think I'm going to get him to just speak a little generally about um, things he notices might be a little confusing. Um, okay, so I'll catch you up. I just kind of giving people a background on maybe your taxonomical expertise, and then you coming into the Cubensis community, um, identifying uh, you know like misunderstandings that a lot of people might have. Um, so you want to maybe just in this this podcast, you know, we can get super deep and nerdy on a, a special podcast or something and just get really hardcore into taxonomy considerations. But like just general things that you're noticing um, and things that you think are worth uh, clarity that you think you can easily provide or new ways to think about naming and taxons and, and things like that. Without yeah. going like crazy, Ron Carlson, I, ICBN, I oh, like I, I yes, just just some some basics. Like, give us a taste of of what this amounts to. Okay, um, I think uh, I think it all focuses around the name. So, like, let's if we start out with let's say a simple example, like Homo sapiens. That's humans, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you look at the variety in humans, um, and and you attach that name to it. I, I think I'm I'm more of what we what in taxonomy they call a lumper. So we have what we call the lumpers that kind of put things together. That mm -hmm. would be say like calling all humans Homo sapiens, even though right. there's brown ones and black ones and white ones, and right. you know that that would be the the lumping kind of the camp. Mm -hmm. And then there's the splitters. The splitters would be the people that would say take every kind of different dog and say, well, that's not just canis domesticus or canis lupus right. or whatever it's called now like that's a german shepherd and that's a chihuahua and they right. would make 
make taxonomic ranks. Remember, all of this stuff is very artificial. Remember, all of sure. those things that we call ranks are, are human inventions that we yeah. put. Nature doesn't care. <clears throat> like nature doesn't really care if it's a species or a genus or a variety or a subspecies that like nature doesn't really care. <clears throat> so in different like types of organisms, they have sort of sort of almost like paradigms or conventions that they use yeah. that have been for like the orchid people. They grow orchids. They want to sell pretty orchids. Mm -hmm. So they have a very different way for naming things. Um, horse breeders, you know, they want to make fast horses. So I don't imagine the horse breeders are sitting around as, is this a variety or a species? They just know like that guy, you know, does well when he blanks that girl, <laughs> you know, and they make good babies and those babies right. run fast. Like very, very practical um, kind of aspects. So they wouldn't be care. They wouldn't really care what right. they call it, you know. Um, so I don't. I, I hate to say it. It's it's funny, but me being even trained in this, you start to realize that some of these things don't really matter as much as we like to pretend they do. Sometimes, right? Like a name is just kind of a name. Like you got a nickname. You probably got like pet names. You got what your friends called you in high school. You're still the same person. Right. Um, but, but these naming conventions, I don't, I don't know. I feel a little bit, which is a little bit ironic considering I, I spent so much time going through the nitty gritty details of all right. this stuff is that the names are kind of a little bit, uh, like they're just superfluous and, and kind of irrelevant even sometimes. Sure. Which, which comes back to the, like the record keeping thing is that you, you have to keep, so, so nomenclature is what they call the naming system. That's like mm -hmm. the fancy name for how you name stuff. Taxonomy is where you separate things based on criteria that you think right. is important. That's a very, very important thing is that what is important to you is color. Like, I love the fact that I could take a typical albino fruit and I could hand it to a police officer and they would have absolutely, I could hand, I could hand an, an ape or an, an albino Avery or whatever. I could hand yeah. that to a trained mycologist, Ron Peterson, my right. advisor. If I handed him an ape and was like, Hey Ron, look at this, man, this is a special one. You, you want to tell me what it is? He would have no clue. Yeah. Like no clue. Right. He would be like, well, cubes are supposed to have purple, brown, dark spores and the strophariaceae and adnex gills and, and a veil. Right. And this one doesn't have a veil. It doesn't any have any of that, of that stuff. Like yeah. this is not a cube. This. So this is where we're going to get in trouble with the natalensis. Eventually the descriptions of these things oh, sure. is that, that also the, the artificially grown fruit are not going to exhibit the same morphology as a wild fruit. This is just simple as that. Like those guys you were saying who, who grow, uh, you mentioned it, like they grow outdoors. Like a wild growing cube looks so different from what we grow in our little trays and yeah. tubs. They do not look yes. the same. And you would be hard pressed to find any taxonomic or, or morphological features to separate any of the cubes that we grow when you start right. talking about like spore sizes you're talking about like one or two microns difference and then you start right. talking about the statistics when you measure 20 spores or 40 spores and then you're like yeah. wow we got a standard deviation of like two microns on an eight micron measurement so that means it could be six or ten or eight right. or it's like whoa <laughs> So when you start doing species, and so I hate to say it, but morphology for our cubes is not very helpful, especially when you get down to the cultigens. Right. So trying to differentiate, say, a gnat from a cube. Uh, I'll let Using I'll just talk. physical morphological yeah, characteristics not, not, doesn't work. It's going to happen. Yeah. It's, not, right. it's impossible. I mean, for, for Christ, I, I, I had like 80 different species of Lentinus that I was dealing with. And these are well-established morphological species. And even then, man, you're, you're looking under the microscope and you're like, yeah, that's a basidia, but is that an right. 18 micron or 20 micron long? <laughs> yeah. right. And you really start to go crazy. And that's when you realize, um, a lot of the publications and, and the, the work people do is, is because they have to. They're forced to publish. So they find a new specimen that looks a little different, you know, growing out by the burning barrel or under the apple tree. And they're like, this is a new species of Morcella. And you're right. like, well, you know, your morel grew 
next to a fucking bin that you've been burning trash in for the last eight years. <laughs> like, like, Who knows? Maybe it looks a little different, you know, right. than the one you find yes. growing out under the elm tree in the woods. And right. it's not maybe a new species because it's darker. It's just because the soil and it got charcoal right. on it when it popped up out of the ground. <laughs> yeah, it's like an azalea where you just feed it yeah, you know, yeah. something and look, changes color right there. Bam, what, you know, it's nothing different. You just put different juice in the ground and it's doing something else now. Yeah, we're, we're fucking with it basically yeah so now so talk about that as it pertains to um without really go i i definitely eventually want to do a separate uh episode about gnats but um let's just talk a little bit about um your work in dna sequencing and the idea of like how many base pairs you know differ even within the same species and what that percentage looks like versus um, how base pair differentiation percentage is, you know, between a cat and a dog or a chimp and a human and what those percentages look like. And I think as that relates to biological concept speciesation, yeah. that, that might be important information for people to just kind of get wet their whistle on. I was hoping Alan would answer that question today. <laughs> <laughs> um. he, he can He can answer it too. In lieu of Allen's, uh, let's see. Okay, uh, here's a problem. So I, I know I, I'm familiar with what Allen does, and uh, I, I, I hate to, like, um, it, it's even more complicated than he typically presents it as. Sure. I think, because, he, he, I think he purposely doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, he, I think he, he simplifies, yes. So what 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 is now referred to kind of universally as the barcoding system, which sometimes people call fingerprinting, which are, are kind of slightly different terms, but they sort of become synonymous with the right. with the general public. Uh, you're looking at a very particular region in in the case of most fungi. You're looking at the ITS or the internally transcribed spacer region, which is about eight or nine hundred. I think it's eight eight sixty or eight sixty four somewhere around there. It's a it's a this ACGs and Gs, and you can compare those among species. And now where here's the problem that that's fine. Discrete DNAs, ACGs and Ts. Nobody can argue with that. There there are some yeah. technical issues that you can bring up, but but assuming you have a definitive ACGT sequence for the ITS for let's say um, a lentinus, and you compare that to let's say a puffball. Now that difference is going to be so large that it'll be obvious, and you have morphological characteristics like you know a shiitake and a puffball. They're obviously the, different. Yeah, they're not the same. Nobody's going to argue with that. But when you get down, so so then you've got to put a number. Let's say there's, oh, I don't know, let's say a five percent difference between a a, lentine, a, a, a shiitake and a puffball. Sure. Well, then what if you compare, like, let's say a big puffball to a small puffball, like somebody mentioned in the chat. Um, oh, by the way, the the wolf slime is actually a slime mold. That's a, that's another thing. That's not a puffball, but um, but if you compare, let's say a big a big like a, a little tiny uh, puffball, like um, uh, piriforma which a pear-shaped puffball to a big giant one they're mm -hmm. going to be different but how much different are they going to be so then you got to look at that and you got to put a you got to put a sort of arbitrary kind of designation then where where do you where do you separate species right when you get to things and that now you're you're talking specifically since we're playing this new dna genome sequencing game and and, and we're doing so much with relating to the, the genome itself and the differences in ITS and whatnot, you're, you're almost isolating that away from any of the older ways that things were differentiated, right? Other older, are, are you talking almost in isolation? These numbers are, are, can be pretty arbitrary or, or no. Um, maybe arbitrary is not the right word. You're trying to correlate. So what I did was I'm try I was trying to correlate morphology, which is what you see under the microscope, as well mm -hmm. as the macroscopic appearance. Also with the habitat, um, sometimes habitat can be quite uh, important. 
uh, you know, something grows on the wood or ground or it's mycorrhizal right. or whatever. Um, but also um, correlating the, the, the things you can see under the microscope, physical characteristics with the DNA. So and then and then you throw the extra layer of the biological species and whether things can mate onto onto the top of that. Right. So with with my 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 group, the Lentinus, the, the morphology that was already well known. That was done by Pegler and this guy named Corner, even in Southeast Asia. They're they're what we call cosmopolitan species. Everybody knows what they are. Yeah. Et so that wasn't a problem. The problem was what I was trying to do was essentially see what amount of DNA sequence separates species? Like, what is the number? The, the problem is in different groups, that number can be different. So if you have a group that has recently evolved or diverged from a common ancestor, those, what you might want to call species, those little twigs on the tree, they might not be that different. Right. So, so just for, as an example with cubes, cubes are a cosmopolitan species that spread with cattle dung, you know, right. the whole st stoned ape and all that domestication of cattle, et cetera, et cetera. So what we consider to be, uh, you know, I don't know, a GT or a B plus or a Texas orange cap or, or not a lensis or a trans key or whatever. These are all derived from a very, very common recent ans uh, a very recent common right. ancestor so it makes sense that they wouldn't be that different but right. where do you make where do you where do you draw that line that's right. the problem that's where the problems start what people i'll tell i can tell you right now what will happen is after its people will start moving to different different parts of the genome so a lot of people will use, uh, I think I might have forwarded you a paper. It's, it's kind of, it's a little bit technical, but things like the RNA polymerase genes, sometimes the RPB, you might've heard that, or the, the mm -hmm. elongation factor, the EF, you might see something like EF1, I think is the one they're using. You might see LSU, which is the large subunit of the ribosomal DNA. You get into different, so evolutionary rates. So different parts of the genome will, evolve or mutate essentially at different rates so right. the its is is the most convenient and easily amplified for various reasons um and it's the easiest to look at and also there's a lot of sequences already out there in GenBank to compare to right so, so if you are how did how did they come about like why is its the identifier region when because i think you used a great example talking to me one time mm. where you said something like you could take 20 different mammals but if you look at the sequence the genomic sequence that transcribes for hemoglobin then we would all be the same species yeah exactly. so that like where you're looking on and i mean the genome for mammals are is a massive genome i don't i don't know how the size wise how the data compares with fungus versus uh humans but either way i'm assuming it's a still pretty big, large big. yeah <laughs> yeah like i think a lot of genome. megabytes yeah i think the cube is over 60 megabases yeah it's okay. it's a big like so that's like 60 million bases it's right. a lot. It's m way yeah. more than, um, and people will talk about. And they're using, you're saying they're using 860 yep, base exactly. pairs for, oh, here, Julian so just it, said 40, 46 megabytes worth of data. Ah, yeah. Yeah. That was 64, 46. Yeah. yeah I couldn't yeah. remember. Um, yeah, that's a lot. Uh, that's a lot even. For it's a, a lot of just, it's a lot of letters. <laughs> Well, and then you get into issues of things like alignment. You have to ha make sure that all of the the bases that should be aligned, you know, so mm -hmm. if you get a, a change in a base, it's not simply that you've like accidentally shifted the sequence or right. there was a gap or a deletion. Then you get into technical issues and, and really that's when you start staring at a screen with a bunch of ACGTs. And, right, and, meaning and, like if one of those C's is in the wrong spot, Fucks yeah. the whole shit up. Just simply yeah. that you accidentally your elbow hit the space bar and you didn't right. realize it and you shifted your whole sequence over yeah. one base. And you were telling me all. that this kind of error actually happens oh, more it's, than, it's than people want to talk common. about. Yes. People, the data miners will sometimes simply just go in and then 
reanalyze other people's sequences because they'll come up with now i think for most publications you actually not only have to publish your trees but all the 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 dendrograms that you yeah. you know generate the little twiggy things but you also yeah. have to to put your alignment your real actual raw alignment the actual file has to be yeah available. yeah because when you're dealing especially at the beginning and end of your sequences there are like bits and pieces that you might not have information for right and they become kind of like missing characters that eh, non-informative stuff that people just don't want to talk about sure <laughs> Oh, dude, try, I mean, I can only imagine when, when you're dealing with academic uh, discipline that's scientific or like uh, mathematic, right? Like you, it's harder to fudge things in, until the data sets become massive. And then it probably gets very easy to fudge mm -hmm. things or, yeah. or, you know, let some mistakes slide and things like that. And so when you start talking about you know, is there just a raw percentage of, you know, how many base pairs in ITS can differ to consider something, um, you know, the same species or different species? Um, I think you mentioned, let me forget if you sent this to me or not, but you were saying that even within the same species, you could have, was it half a percent, one percent um, differentiation within, you know, you know, like me and you, if our ITS was compared... Yeah there would be variation, even though we're definitely, obviously, not only both human beings, but, but we don't look terribly different, right? Like we're both some white guys. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, and that's where you get into the kind of practical aspects, like even for human genomics, you know, when, when people are talking about like the 23 and me and that kind of stuff, the, they're looking at such a small, they're, they're SNPs, what you normally, what they're looking at, these single nucleotide polymorphisms uh -huh. and, that's more of a genome, but you're still looking at a sample of, of your genome. It's just right. not practically, um, we're not, we can't sequence. And to be honest, we don't have all the, this, this is where the collaboration comes into is if you're going to, if you're going to sell a new pheno or a new cross, like you have to be willing to submit it to right. a database. You, I'm sorry, but you just can't be like, this is my new shit, buy it. And whoa, nobody can have it. Like you've got to be willing to submit this stuff and put it up for public scrutiny. Right. And, yeah. So, I mean, this is when, you, when you were talking about, um, and then I forget if you said somebody is mentioning this to you, but I've talked to several people about this. Um, Dirty South Myco talks about this a lot where you kind of create these little clusters of people that are on the same page as you and you feel like, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. He's doing some, so like I can send him some monos cause he's going to send me some monos or I can send him some swabs cause he's going to send me swabs, but there probably needs to be a lot more of that and probably at a more formal structured scale. And then we can probably really start accomplishing some pretty cool shit. I mean, but, yeah. but it's gotta be, you know, it's like your Ron Carlson guy who's, formulating his his little icbn you know rules for taxonomic consideration of fungi and it's this ed sent me this this link to the stuff and it's like the most boring if then like if you uh, think computer programming is boring holy shit this is really <laughs> boring um the things you got to go through just to truly have um you know, say something name. important to get yeah to get your thesis uh, approved or whatever yes it's a mess you so, so like, these, I didn't even, they have these lists of what are called synonymy, where it's basically the same exact fungus that people have renamed and renamed and renamed. Right. Some of them are like four or five pages long and it's the same mushroom, exactly the same, but people have given a different name and right. it's from a different country. And, and that's a whole other you know, if yeah, you dude, that's like a stand up comic on in New York City telling a joke yeah. at the same time that the guy on in LA is telling the joke, and it's a timely joke. And then, you know, it's like, you know, nobody ripped anybody off, it just kind of happened to coincide. Yeah. And, um, what do you do now? How do you handle that, you know, s lack of standardization? Um, somebody asked me, uh, and they they referenced it with human beings, but I'm gonna I'm gonna transcribe it into more of a fungal concern. Um, what has to happen um, before science knows like exactly where the gene is for a long stipe 
or a gnarly stipe or a, a brown cap versus a white mm. cap where they really start knowing the regions that are responsible for certain morphological um, factors. And, and then we could start really playing with that. Or like, I think Julian and Kylor talked about, you know, they dream of the day where they would know exactly where psilocybin, um, you know, the, the sequence for that, which they kind of know where that is, but that you could actually then, you know, put that into the genome for oyster mushrooms. And, and now you have oyster mushrooms that, you know, blew on yeah. break and, you know, yeah, <laughs> oyster yeah. mushroom sales go way up, that sort of thing. I hear people saying that, yeah, quite often. I, I mean, we're pretty far off from some of that, mostly just because the interest in doing that research is is less than it would be for human beings is, is that yeah well it's, it's what's what's the plant people call qtls quantitative okay. trait loci um they do it in soybeans so they're a little bit related to the smps so when they get your lineage say you're irish or you're german or you're sub-saharan african they they have to have markers and, right. and so yeah those markers in the plant world there's again there's a lot of different terms i i'm, I'm not familiar with all of them but they call them qtls quantitative quantitative trait loci which are essentially markers so in one genotype uh, one cultivar of a soybean that might let's just say tall and another one would be right. maybe a good yielding variety high oil content they know what traits to look for but they're macroscopic traits so instead of having to go through the whole gene <clears throat> DNA sequencing, so that's kind of where they get the quantitative, qualitative trait thing sure. is that they can look and they can see a certain leaf shape. And they're right. like, well, that leaf shape indicates a high oil production. They don't necessarily need to know the genetic reason for it. It's just a very practical thing. Right. Okay. Um, and I would love to like whoever said that, I would love to get into the key. I've actually been leaning more towards the kind of QTL version of breeding. Whereas if I know I get a phenotype from this monocarrot, so you can go back to even the monocarions can have different expressions of or, or different genetic uh, each mono each monocarion has its own genotype right, right. so yeah. even then you're so if you're crossing i heard yoshi talking about this like you know he had what 19 natalensis monocarions like right each one of those is probably pretty uniform but sure. You could technically take all 19 of those and mix them with what and yeah then it gets the numbers get astronomical yeah. But yeah, the QTL thing, if we could as a community come together and be like, well, you know, everybody did this cross. Like, let, let's say somebody just did cross GT. I crossed it with a, I crossed GT with a Burma and I crossed GT with a Colombian. I crossed GT with a, uh, you know, a Cambodiansis or uh, a Cambodian, not a Cambodian, uh, a Cambodian or whatever. And, oh, we all got this kind of um, this phenotypic expression. Maybe it's a, a wavy cap or a big cap or mm -hmm. problem. Problem is we're back there to environmental and, and, and phenotypic expression and phenotypic plasticity. How oh, yeah. is a grow that I do and you do going to be different? And I grow in a monotub, you grow in a tray, somebody else grows in a bag. Then we're back to that issue. Even if we all have clones of the same supposed pheno, we're going to probably get different outcomes. Right. I mean, it's like, uh, I forget what the variety was, but uh, I think uh -huh. it was within the tech community. And basically nobody was having success except for one grower. I forget if it was Tim Pig or who it was. And they just at, at a certain point chalked it up to there must be something in his environment that's allowing for it to, to be more successful than, than, oh, here, uh, Julian said it was Joe Boo, or oh, maybe that's not reference to that anyway. Um, but like, yeah, for, I mean, because the organism, uh, fungus to me are very different than, than mammals, where like, if I'm a monkey, I can be in China and be a monkey, or I can move to South Carolina and be a monkey, but wherever I go, I'm still, I'm still a monkey, right? Whereas fungus, it might grow in the ground in one place, but it might not grow in the other, or it might fruit a certain way or at a certain time in this location. And there's a lot, it seems like there's a variability and it's almost like possibly epigenetic factors that is pretty radically understudied. Is we another, just don't even have a yes. Clue. 
that's like a whole clue. other podcast. Yeah. That's a whole that's the next generation of cube farmers, man. Figure out that epigenetic stuff. And so that's when guys like term. the good fun guy says things like, you know, I really like put out good vibes with my fruit and <laughs> my fruit give me good vibes back. I'm sitting back going fucking might be true, man. Like I, 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 can, I know I can want to be like, I don't know. That sounds a little like hoo hoo for me, but, but on the flip side, I don't know. I've seen his bags. They look real good. He, he must be taking good care of them. Who knows, man? We, know. you know, epigenetics. We don't really know anything like, about it. Oh God, no. it, that's and it's all it. uh, that. I would, like, we don't need to get into that. No. Well, yeah, my friend always says like, you gotta sing to your mushrooms. I'm like, well, is death metal okay? Like, how about I? How about I point? Somebody suggested the band Nun Slaughter. On that's a good band, by the way. Slaughter <laughs> on one of the of the. Nut none slaughter. It's good band. Oh, okay. The mushrooms like it. The mushrooms like it. <laughs> they like none slaughter, sure. Okay. None slaughter. Yeah, that's their their favorite. Yeah. The, the, the but that's like that. Love. Did you ever see that book? This was kind of like in the self-help, you know, guruism circles of, of Los Angeles. There was some Japanese researcher who um photographed uh crystallization of water. Um yeah, I guess he froze it or whatever. And like yeah, yeah, he would yeah. tell some water he loved it. And then this is what the crystals <laughs> look like. And then he told other water he hated it or he wished it would die. And and this is what it looked like. <laughs> and I mean, I wanted to be like, this is fucking stupid. And you're you're like, uh, you're taking like just physical randomness and, and putting so much onto it. But then you read about other stuff and it's like, no, man, like genes are mutating and sometimes they're doing it I because know. of thoughts I'm having. What? Or I... if you start studying, dude, you want to get real deep and this pertains to microdosing, I think, um, you know, if you study these FDA uh, approved drugs, you know, and they maybe they have an efficacy in the 80s or 90s and they get FDA approval, um, there was one, uh, one this guy was telling me about. Um, so I went and I looked up the, the study and uh, it was a blood pressure medication. And I think it was 86% efficacy. It got FDA approval. The placebo group, the sugar pill group mm -hmm. had an efficacy rate of 74%. Yeah. Oh yeah. I read, I, I heard what about the some fuck, of those, dude? those like, SSRI studies that like the placebos were just pretty much the same. They had to do the four, like they the had to fuck trial. with those studies to get them. Yeah. Cause they don't make any money selling sugar pills. Exactly. You know. And they've been pumping that to people for 30 years. It's like Christ. And, ah. yeah. yeah. But I mean, that's significant. Right. And, and ask any old school family doctor, you know about the placebo mm. effect and they'll be like yeah oh, sometimes man. sometimes you just got to give somebody something you yeah know, they do that here too they they that's especially if you're paying for it that you want yeah. pills right yeah but yeah here they just I, I try to tell people clinically there'll be people in a lot of pain and and i have to tell them like look i could give you morphine until you passed out and you wouldn't be pain anymore because you wouldn't be conscious. But clinically, that's a dangerous situation. And we can't afford to have you in that situation, given what's going on with you right now. Um, so we can't do that. And I, I try to tell people, like, I can promise you that if you turn the TV on or you talk to your friend about something that you want to talk to them about, d being distracted from your pain is as effective as any drug I can give you. And some will go, oh, good idea. Yeah, I'll do that. And others, you know, they don't want to listen. They just want to suffer and talk about their pain endlessly until I give them more morphine. But it's true. You know, the, the mind is, it, it's, uh, it's doing a lot. <laughs> I'm trying really hard not to turn into one of those grumpy old men. I'm like, ah, I'm getting like some days I'm like, meh, 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 meh. I'm like, yeah. ah, don't be one of those people. Like there's much better things in life. It's like go outside and I don't know, I'll eat a hot dog on a stick or something. Like there's all yeah. kinds of weirds, weird stuff going on outside my house every day. I go fight chickens or something. Yeah, dude, I can't even imagine. I mean, I'm so Americanized. I mean, I'm you know, I lived in LA. It's pretty culturally diverse, but uh, it's not just straight up Thailand, which is 
it's like every day is like i can literally just go into the 7-eleven is like a trip man it's like wow there's yeah. like constant but you know I, I wanted to talk about that too like it's it's a uh, it's strangely normal living here like a lot of americans are really afraid to like leave america but you know it's sure. it's remarkably normal every day it's just kind of like normal you go to work you go to sleep yeah. you know whatever it's it's nothing it's not people always are like kind of afraid of leaving america it's it's not really that scary outside of yeah. america but like people don't want to kill you you may right. think British people are kind of assholes, but no. <laughs> they might not like you, but they don't want to kill you. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody else in the world's fine. Burmese people, Chinese, but they, they are, yeah. everybody I meet, they're like, eh, you just, you, you blend into like, you're just another white guy. Like they don't really yeah. care about you. Like they got better shit to do, you know, <laughs> you're yeah. just another white dude. They don't really care. Exactly. Just there's, it's so funny. I, I remember the first time I read the statistic that like only 11% of the global population is white. And it was just so, that statistic was so contrary to, of course, like small town, Western Michigan, where <laughs> I had one Indian friend and I had one Mexican friend and I, maybe about 30% of our school was black, but I mean, it was not terribly culturally diverse. And I definitely didn't get exposed to like cultural behaviors that, that went against uh, or were different from, you know, what I grew up with. People went to potlucks, they went to church. It was so homogenous that, I mean, you know, you, you I know, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You, you know all about it. It's so the same. And so it's like, well, of course everybody's racist because they just, they're just afraid of everything because they've not been exposed to literally anything. Yeah, well, see, here they embrace racism. Like, I get, like, it's, I, I, this is a strange, I, I don't want to get into this topic because I know it's all triggered and everything in the US, but here they're straight up racist. They don't give a shit. They're what? like, you're, they are totally, like, if I go to a national park, I get charged like 10 times the amount just simply because I'm white. Like, they don't care if you have like a wow. work permit of anything. They're just like, they look at you and you're like, you're white, you're rich you pay 10 times more. <laughs> wow. It's funny. You start to like, sort of like, it becomes kind of comical. It works both ways, you know? Like, so I they like their virtue signaling, but with their racism, basically, like they're just like, yeah, I don't, they just honor. don't think about it that much, man. Americans are too uptight about a lot of shit. They just don't True. think about it. They don't really like, they got other stuff to do, like work and make money and feed their family. Like they're not too right. bothered with this kind of stilly shit that Americans are. But yeah, it, uh, dude, it's a, I know you're not here and I know you haven't been here in a hot minute, but it's, yeah, uh, it's, time. it's an odd place right now. It doesn't uh, feel I, quite like the country used to feel. It's very strange. I know. I, I, I talk to my friends and I, I don't, I don't even know what to say to them. I'm like, sorry you have to yeah. live there <laughs> like i don't know what yeah. to say i'm trying to uh, buy some property in the up right now to be quite honest just like i never thought i'd be be a prepper or or <laughs> making a bug out plan but i'm just like man, i don't now. know i i know guys right now that are in facebook groups and all they're talking about is they're just like ready to shoot their democrat neighbor i'm mm. like what the fuck is wrong with this country right now? Like we're all just trying to take care of our kids and it's crazy, dude. Dude, you might not believe this, but I literally did not know who the vice president was until about a month ago. Yeah. Somebody well, who, people here reading? don't know who the vice president is, dude. Oh, and honestly, okay. I don't know what the fuck she's doing. I, we really don't hear much about her. I mean, I liked her. Okay. I, I lived in was LA talking but... about her. I'm like, it's a, it's a woman. And I'm like, and they're black, like she's black, right? Yeah. I'm like, I didn't know. I kept that. hoping Joe was going to die so she could be the first female president. I thought that'd be awesome. But that, uh, oh, yeah, he's, he's not dying. D Dave Chappelle made a joke about that a long time about how he was going to get a Mexican vice president so nobody'd shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, watch out, dude. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, I say, man, I didn't, I didn't he say is, it. Dave, it Dave he is that. just, he is, uh, he's a ruthless genius. He's doing uh, everything that should be done with comedy right now. He's doing it. I don't even, you ain't got to agree with him, but he's, he's working at a level with his comedy that people, 
I mean, I know he's he's, he's fun, amazing. Man. He'll go he's down amazing. in history for sure. He really will. Well, we're three hours in. Um, we we've touched oh. on quite a bit of stuff. Um, I, it's no big deal for you. You're just gonna like get on with your day because what is it? It's, yeah. it's noon there. Noon, yeah. I got to go to yeah. immigration, actually. I got to go check in 90-day bullcrap. You just say hello. Hey, look, oh, I'm still here. And yeah, then you leave. I'm still here. It's fun. Cool, man. Get some, get some lunch. Well, go get some lunch. It's been a pleasure. Sorry it was very last minute, but I really no problem, appreciate man. you uh, being, uh, you know, I would expect no uh, less neuroplasticity than a willingness to wake up and immediately do a podcast. Um yeah. I, like I said, I'm, I'm used to this kind of impromptu stuff, man. Being a teacher, you got to kind of sometimes be sure. ready like Johnny on the spot, man. Yeah. Sorry well, for the I appreciate socks, it. Guys. I didn't we, my earphone. It was, I got used to it after a while. I liked I it better it when like you just had doggy. it draped down. Yeah. What's that, that doggy? The, the fluffy aired dog. Clifford. Clifford. Clifford, yeah. Yeah. Wow, you still remember American culture. I'm so impressed. I do. I haven't forgot it. I, I do miss it once in a while, but yeah. I don't know. But yeah, way. Ed, he's he's a total turncoat, man. He I mean, what did you say? How many times have I'm you been back to the trader. States? I'm like a couple, right? Once once in eight. I have not gone back in 17 years. Damn, it must be nice over there. I'm gonna have to come visit. We're gonna do a it family. Is, man. Give me a couple years. I got my youngest has to get a little bit older. He still doesn't travel super Definitely. well. I'll be um, here, man. You know, for anybody who's who's passing through, you know, I mean, hit me up because I, I don't travel that much because I just don't have like a reason. It's not that I don't have time or money. I just don't have a reason. They sure. have beautiful beaches here, man. Beautiful beaches, mountains, the cultural thing, the food. Like it's it's kind of like a one. It's like a one stop shop. Like if yeah. you want to just come to Asia and you want to hit up Cambodia, Vietnam, maybe even Malaysia, Hong Kong. Hey man, what about all... Laos? Can I can I go yeah, to Laos? Yeah, right. Yeah, oh hell yeah, yeah. it's right Laos. next door. Dude, I could get yeah. on a bus and be there in like two yeah. hours. Like, cool. if you're if you're in Bangkok, you can. It's like the hub for Southeast Asia. Yeah. So if you if you can get your butt into Bangkok and then just you can like figure it out. If you've got a month to travel, man, you can just hit every country here. And it's really cheap, you know, like my lunch is going to cost me like two bucks, you know, beers are like a dollar fifty for a big bottle. I like that. Like, Yeah, it's dirt cheap. And cigarettes are still like reasonably priced. I think they're like, no, $3. guys, don't smoke. No, no terrible no, no, no. for you. And weed's but legal. Weed's legal, man. But weed's, weed's still legal. like U.S. prices. It's like about twenty five bucks a gram. Because they God. got the maybe good. you're growing the wrong stuff, Ed. <laughs> I know. I thought <laughs> about it. That. They do sell like huge bricks. Like you can buy. I bought like a hat, literally like a half kilo brick for like fifty bucks. Wow! <laughs> but it's like the dirt. It'd be like the right. Mexican brick weed stuff, you know. That, yeah, it's it, got it, like twigs okay. and sticks and seeds. A little and, bit. Yeah, little bit. Yeah, a little, little bit of gravel. It's it's better quality than it was like thirty years ago. But like it's still, you know, yeah, you find a rock in there yeah. once in a while. Sure. <laughs> You can smoke a rock. It's all Maybe good. like, you know, some leftover sock or something. Right. Just some random garment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool, man. Well, uh, we'll do it again. Well, uh, you know, based on feedback, we'll see what people were the most interested in. But I, I'd love to actually get you and a couple other guys to talk further about, you know, the DNA and stuff like that. So I was going to use yeah. your podcast and Alan's podcast to kind of gauge interest and uh, hopefully, mm. uh, you know, keep. Uh, giving people more enticement to get to get into it more and more. Um, Ed was kind enough to get me into the 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 rabbit hole of uh, you know um, comparing a, a genomic sequence to another one, and so I'm, I'm just starting to learn some of that stuff. Uh, super super newbie, um, but maybe we can get into eventually get into some of that stuff because um, yeah, because it looks fun and maybe we can uh, learn some shit and figure some stuff out that'd be great yeah it's a deep hole man yep so hole. so guys uh we're thinking next week uh we're gonna get uh alan back and so we'll just flip flop here um i will update uh the description so we have all the ads contact uh ways you can reach him uh he has a, a nice little uh, youtube channel going um lots of nice tips and tricks you can reach out to him 
um, uh, through my Discord or on Facebook. And, uh, you know, if you've got questions, he probably has something to say about it. Um, and if he doesn't, he'll just tell you he doesn't know. So uh, either way, uh, uh, better than better than being shrouded in mystery. So uh, I, I've been enjoying my friendship with him, and uh, hopefully uh, more people are able to connect and uh, learn a few things from him. So anyway, all right, guys, thanks for staying up so late. Uh, this was a long one, and we retained oh, uh, uh, quite a quite a bit of our viewership. So I appreciate that. Uh, so until next week. Uh, Keep growing and uh, learning and, and teach me everything you know. Okay. Bye, boys. Yeah. <laughs>